Hello everybody, James here, episode 56 of Storytime with Dutch Mantel. Now I'm going to be rushing through these plugs even quicker than usual because we've got plenty of news and we have a special guest as well that I'll let Dutch introduce in a bit. But for now, Owen Hart, King of Pranks, I have written two books. That is the first, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion. That is the second book, What I Wrote. And just as important, if not more important, The World According to Dutch by Dutch Mantel. And of course, Tales from a Dirt Road as well. And you can get all four of those books from Amazon if you want them signed. The Dutch Mantel ones, you go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's.com. And we've also got T-shirts out, of course. You people mean nothing to me, the link. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we just had a, I think we both agree with that one at the moment. And also the <laughs> new uh, the new T-shirt as well. Respect the stash that I'm wearing once again because I lost it last week. And that's pretty much it. Give us five stars on iTunes. Okay, Dutch, we've got lots of news. Uh, half of it you feature in quite heavily as well. <laughs> so you're really making the news this week, Dutch, uh, as this pod- oh. podcast is as well. Uh, I know I know what you're thinking. We'll get to that second. But first... Uh, oh, actually, first off, best wishes to Tommy Dreamer, who is dealing with about skin cancer at the moment. And um, I was thinking about this. I think, like, Alexa Bliss like had a melanoma or something like that as well. It seems to be, like, fairly common with wrestlers because, you know, they've got to look good for TV and they tan so much. Sorry about that technical issue. Right, so uh, we're going to go into, (laughs) sort of, uh, Booker T's response. So we posted a video last week where we talked about Booker T. uh, Well, say we, you, talked about Booker T and him being a bit difficult to work with in TNA. And then he came out with a video response. Someone commented on our video saying, you know that Booker T will respond because whenever he's mentioned, he's got a response to it on his podcast. Uh, and he did. And you watched his response and talk us through what he said, well, uh, uh, the crux of what you said, and then talk us through Booker T's reply. Well, <clears throat> I was talking, I like Booker T. He's a great talent. Don't get me wrong. I'm not mad at him. I don't think he's mad at me. But he just stated his side, and I I stated what I had to say. And I stated that he was a little difficult to work with in TNA. See, he never refuted, refuted that. What he said was he was ashamed over the way he acted at times in TNA. So that's like like telling me, hey, I was hard to work with in TNA, and you're right. He kind of corroborated what I said. And I told this story about him going to – he didn't like something one day, and he went to Vince, then to me, then to Jeff, then back around. And he said that didn't happen. Well, it did happen, and – we finally ended up changing it. I guess Vince did because I didn't come up with it in the first place, but he didn't like to be uh, categorized like that. And he said another thing. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't given his notice by the WWE. Uh, I don't understand that because he said he was at the top of his game in WWE. I don't know of anybody who's ever been let go in WWE at the top of their game. Well, I don't. I, I, I can't say that. Well, the, uh, the I think the crux of that matter is that uh, Booker T's name was part of the um, Signature Pharmacy welfare scandal, um, and Booker T. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, Signature Pharmacy was like an online chemist basically okay. was like farming out certain stuff Booker T's name was on it I think a lot of people got suspended from that list but Booker T said listen my I've never bought anything from them and he basically resigned from WWE in protest okay but uh, why didn't he explain it like that uh, maybe he doesn't That's want to bring un- it up in the first place then because I mean we're sort of bringing <laughs> it up but I mean I mean it's all out there uh you know we're not talking out uh hey out it's not yet Hey, it's not like he damn killed somebody. And if he quit, that's fine. Hmm. Now his, his statement makes more sense. He, he was at the top of his game and he quit to save everybody, uh, a lot of trouble and, and hassle. And I salute him for that, but he came on. What I do like Booker is I want to thank you 
for doing a 25 minute interview about me and the podcast, because if it gets out and um, more people will know it. And I, I thank you a lot. <laughs> I also thank Rick Flair a while back because he got the podcast uh, out. People knew I had it. So, and Booker, if I said something wrong, I apologize. I'm just apologize for it because I heard it wrong or you didn't tell me uh, in the right way. Now, James, you're telling me and now I understand it better. So it is what it is. Yeah. With um, He also mentions, I'll, I'll be honest, it was 25 minutes. I, I And I messaged you and say, Dutch, you can't be bothered watching it. <laughs> I watched the first five minutes and just nothing was said. So I was like, I'm, I'm tapping out. But uh, he does bring up the Legends belt, and he says it's one of the prettiest belts that he ever saw. Why was there a Legends belt made in TNA? Or is that just one of many things? No, uh, listen, I've said this time and time again. I, I was in creative. I was in the office three days a week or two days a week, and I still was unaware of some of the things they were doing because it it was either... And when Booker T says the structure was fractured, he's right, because it was. And I never denied that, because it was a fractured structure. I never knew who really ran the place. Jeff was supposed to, but Jeff would get overruled by Dixie if one of the talents went to her and moaned and groaned, and then she would come to come to Jeff and, oh, can you do this or do that? And we would do some things to, you know, pacify the talent, but you can't do that. You cannot be friends with the people that are the talent. You're trying to, you're trying to book a wrestling show. And just because you like one person more than the other, if you let that sway your opinion, then you're not doing your job and you're not really you're making an you you're making a, an assumption on these two guys that one is better than the other one. Or one needs to be pushed more than the other one. But the one that's not getting pushed, he may not like that, and he starts complaining. And it was a mess. It was a mess, and it was hard. Really, I stayed there. Oh, I stayed there a long time. I stayed there eight years, and I've made this comment before. I spent most of my time in catering, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is. Because that's where I'd go to hide out. If you look for me, if you go to catering, I, I'd be sitting in there. Uh, not really, but it was, I enjoyed my time there and I didn't enjoy my time there. Hmm. But I, I do thank Dixie and Jeff for, for, you know, giving me a job for nine years. So, and they walked in one day and said, we're going to finish you up. Okay. They finished me up. I walked out the door. And then you went back for a year much later, and then you spent another year in catering. Uh, <laughs> right. Actually, I, I well, actually I tried to work this time, but still, it's there is a thing to be said about age, and you reach a certain age. Like I'm over seventy, and I will agree with this. Uh, uh, the younger talent, they look at you as old fashioned. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you're, you're forgetful. You're this. Well, I am forgetful. But the things that used to work in wrestling still work, as evidenced by the bloodline angle that they've been running for three years, and still hit stronger today than it was a year ago because they use the old school philosophy. They took their time with it. They didn't get ahead of themselves. They had patience, and we're seeing what it's what it's producing right now. Great story, probably the greatest story ever told in professional wrestling. Now they've been great stories told, but not great stories that last like three years. Never. Maybe Bruno back in the seventies. Because he held he held the belt about eight years. He he may have had some angles that, but I don't think he his angles lasted that long either, at all. They kept changing their top heels, and and the basic premise of getting angles like that, 
you you revolve around a resident baby face. If you look at Lawler in Memphis, he was a resident baby face. You look at Dusty in Florida, he was the resident baby face. Bruno uh, New York and Pennsylvania, the resident baby face. The Von Erics in Texas, the resident baby faces. And all you had to do as the booker is run those big, badass heels in. Run them and just keep running them till you run out of them. And that's what they did. That's how that's how wrestling used to work. You'd, you'd bring them in and you'd get them over and then you'd throw them against your resident baby face. And nine times out of ten, you'd draw money. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I message you this as well. It's, uh, I never until I spoke to you, uh, mentioned it to you recently, and I said, you know, it never occurred to me until you told me that there was no like really long term storylines on the, in the territory days because you didn't know if someone was going to show up or not next week, so you sort of just yeah. had to get the most out of them in a few weeks and then take it from there. Well, what it was, we didn't have contracts, and if a talent got pissed off, or his old lady left him, or hell, he wrecked his car. <laughs> or any number of things, or he got arrested, any number of things could have happened, but this guy's not going to be there, and you've just done this big angle with him, and all of a sudden he's gone. There's a story out of Florida. They would bicycle their tapes. I think we talked about this maybe last week or the week before. Let's say we would do a – in Florida, they would do the Tampa – uh, tape first. And then the second week, the Tampa tape would go to maybe Jacksonville or Tallahassee or something like that. But they had, but Bobby, uh, Bobby Shane, he got killed in a plane crash. Didn't he get killed in Florida? Yes, I think so. Yeah. There's, this is the Austin Idol plane crash one, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby Shane died, Tampa, 1975. Mm-hmm. And some of the uh, tapes, they would bicycle around, and the tape that played in Tampa would play, say, in Jacksonville the week after, and Tallahassee the week after that. But they actually had a deceased man on their tapes for like three weeks after he died. And I guess the people would look at it and say, oh, I don't think that it, it freaked them out, but I bet they said, oh, they made a mistake. And yeah, they did because they didn't edit their tapes. But anyway, that's how the resident babyface angle works. And uh, But WWE didn't even do that. They just took the same guy. They made a heel. He's the resident heel. And they ran babyfaces by him. So actually they did, they, they kind of tweaked uh, the angle and just reversed it, but it still works. Make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, when I explained something, I wanted to make sense because people that listen to this, they said, well, yeah, that kind of, kind of makes sense. And they can look back and see exactly what I'm talking about. They never went too far that they couldn't back up and bring it back. Because I think they've done that before, and all of a sudden they'd bring it back. Uh, but when they'd bring it back, it was actually stronger than what it was before. Tremendous angle. Tremendous. Don't you hate it when people miss the point, Dutch? Oh, yeah. You a lot know people, what I'm getting at. You yeah, know a I'm lot getting. of people miss the point. A let, lot. Let me talk to you about... <clears throat> let someone. me talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> let yeah. me tell you a little story about... Uh, your Twitter post from a few days ago. Now, <laughs> after the AEW Collision show this past Saturday, CM Punk held aloft a fan-made sign. I think it was a fan-made sign. I can't imagine he made it himself, but who knows. <laughs> Reading, support LGBTQ plus youth. You then tweeted the following. Is this a wise move involving a political issue on a wrestling show? I guess the issue that Bud Light and Target have had with the LGBTQ topic has not reached AEW. This shot didn't make the show, but the photo is still there. Comments, WSI underscore YouTube. That's me. So, um, people uh, people were looking at this like some sort of massive attack. Uh, not the band. 
but a, a huge attack on the gay plus community and not uh, i believe that was not your intention no i think they as associated the 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 target boycott and the bud light boycott with what i was saying cuz people tune into wrestling now this this picture did not make the show by the way and if you think about that I don't think it would have made the show because I think they would have edited it out because they apparently have more sense than CM Punk. Well, not more sense, but I don't think they would have showed it. CM Punk can believe whatever he wants to believe. And I do believe in equality <clears throat> for everyone. But when I put that Twitter up, everybody jumped to all kind of conclusions. Oh, I hate gay people. I don't hate gay people. I got gay friends. They make a joke about it. We laugh about it. I don't care. But everybody got all upset. Oh, you piece of this and this and that. Now, listen, you can express, this is what I'm thinking. You can express your views, but yet when I express mine, oh, you shouldn't do that. Some people went as far as call it a hate crime. How is it a hate crime? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Because the First Amendment of our Constitution guarantees my freedom of speech. I've seen a lot of things that I don't think should be allowed. And one thing is I don't think somebody should get in a policeman's face and just cuss him like a dog. I don't believe that. But... I don't get the Can't reference there. What, when did that happen? What, people get in the police face? Yeah, what, what's, yeah. Oh, all the time, all the time. They'll just get right up and call them a SOB and a mf -er and this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 and go on. And the cop has to stand there and take it. And you know how, and it would be hard for me to take that. It'd be hard for, you, I think, anybody to take that. But I think people are sometimes out of control. <clears throat> but the good part about this <laughs> is I got 3.2 million views on my Twitter and uh, 1,730 or 40 comments, which means that the people are watching and i'm i'm glad for that but listen there's no animosity between me and the lgbtq crowd at all and what i was trying to say is you know the people who don't like that if they showed it on the show they may stop merchandise so who are you really hurting if they stop buying tickets and watching uh AEW is hurting themselves. And I want AEW to to continue. I think they had a really a good show. Their first show on Collision was well booked, well executed. And uh, I like the announcers. I like the look of the show. It looks just like a, a toned down raw, really. And but they did a good job with it. We will, uh, I'm going to say a few things then. So I think like the sign held aloft wasn't particularly controversial or anything like that. It might as well have said, just support your fellow person, basically. It was, it was sort of like a very generalized platitude. Uh, so uh, unfairly innocuous uh, in what it was. Uh, to sort of like maybe crystallize maybe your point, I mean, don't tell me if I'm getting the point wrong, is that when a company makes a stance, and I actually did some research on this as well, if a company makes a stance then it's always going to upset somebody, etc., or at least for the most part. And then with the Bud Light issue, I think they did... Uh, there's an old phrase where it says, go woke, go broke, right? And then there's just like some research into it. And the reason why Bud Light sort of suffered so much is because they flip-flopped. It's like they had... I can't remember the model's name they had on the can, whatever it was. And then they sort of started apologising when there was backlash. And then their stock went down and people stopped buying it, whereas other people, other companies have seen... Uh, what is it, Colin Kaepernick? 
uh, the guy who knelt down for the NFL anthems was it that guy? Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Sorry. And I think um, he's yeah. I yeah, he's not playing. No. People don't like him because, to me, I think on a wrestling show at a football game is the wrong place to politic because I think people watch wrestling as an escape. They want to forget the guy got killed down on the corner. They want to forget those guys were in that submarine, that submersible. They want to forget that their grandmother died two months ago. They want to get away from real life and enjoy themselves. But all of a sudden, you slam it back into their face, and then their their joy may not be gone, but it is lessened if they don't agree with it. So why even mess with it? A lot of people just took that wrong and came on Twitter. Oh, yeah, they roasted me. I don't care. And like I said, they have their beliefs. I have mine. And if you don't agree with it, don't follow me or don't reply to me. Replies is oh, you, POS and all that. I don't know. It, it didn't affect me. I don't know. With um, with that being said, politics and wrestling have gone hand in hand since almost wrestling pro wrestling was a thing. You know, from the from the Japanese and the Russians onto, and this is all you know, uh, xenophobia based and, and um, nationalistic based as well. Even you, Zeb Coulter, that was very heavily yep. politics as well. So oh, where's the line in that? I don't think anybody for the Zeb Coulter thing. It was a political theme, and they put it out there for a, a joke, really, I think, thinking everybody would hate me. And I've told this story before. And I would go out there night after night and feel those people. I could, I could check the temperature of the room as I was going through the crowd. And about half of them were supporting my message, and half of them weren't. That was, so what was I? Was I a baby face? Was I a heel? Even the agents used to tell me, oh, the people are going to hate you. And I would think to myself, because don't disagree with them, because you can be too smart for your own good. I would always say, yeah, man, they hate me out there. I, I never disagreed with them. But as it went along, no. I had more and more people kind of supporting me than not supporting me. And whatever they intended for it to do kind of backfired just a little bit. And they had to, they actually ended up kind of turning us baby face against, uh, who's the Russian guy's name? Uh, it's Miro now. Miro. What's, I can't remember. Yeah. Rusev. There we go. Russo. Or whatever he was. But you wouldn't have to work we, hard to get people to boo Vince Russo. <laughs> no, not not Russo. What was his name? No, it's, it's Rusev. 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 That's it. Yeah. And we would go, and we never. They pushed Rusev till the cows come home, and he got over. But I bet you, Jack. Jack never won a match against Rusev. Never. I think he won. No, he, I take that back. He won one in Jacksonville, but it wasn't on. Uh, it, it was recorded, but Tri it was tribute for, for the troops, uh, wasn't it? Tribute for the troops, and it's kind of hard to beat an American against a Russian on that. So yeah. they didn't do it. I've got a theory so for go you. Figure. I've got a theory for you. So if a uh, wrestling personality is going to do something political, they have to be a bad guy because then if they get. Uh, uh, comebacks on it essentially you were meant to boo them anyway and if they're cheered by a certain section then it doesn't matter whereas if it is a good guy doing political stuff then you run far more risk of backlash oh yeah you do as a good guy wanting everybody to like him if he does a political issue he don't want to turn one fan in that crowd or watching on tv against him but the heel has much more room to roam around in and if he wanted to, he could bring it back in one interview. He could 
and he, he could stop it all. But I really enjoyed doing the Zeb Coulter gimmick. I, re I really did. And it was easy to write for. I used to get, I would get this, this, like a piece of paper like this. That was my, that was my interview, which I hated because I never followed it anyway. But I would go out there and I basically hit the bullet points and move on. And nobody said one word to me about that. Not even Vince. And, you know, Vince sits there and he reads the paper like, oh, he should have said this. He should have said that. He never said one word to me about it. So I guess my my longevity in the business kind of influenced uh, Vince because I think he respected that I'd lasted so long in, in, in this business, which is almost unheard of. So anyway, it was mutual respect for, between both of us. Yeah. Uh, to sort of crystallize everything, you weren't criticizing the message. You were criticizing uh, a, a public, uh, well, it's not well, publicly traded, but it's a public company taking a stance on an issue when it can divide certain fans. Okay. One more thing I want to mention about AEW Collision. You said that Collision would do maybe 1.1 million or something like that. And I said mm -hmm. 830,000. And guess what I also, and this is before I knew you, I also said that AEW Dynamite on my first show would be 1.4 million, and it was exactly 1.4 million. I am the greatest predictor of television <laughs> ratings for AEW TV shows ever. You're Nostradamus. I am. I'm a prognosticator. You've, pred <laughs> You've predicted the future. <laughs> but it did 816,000 views. Yep, viewers. 14,000 off. I, I'm, I'm considering that a win. I'm considering that a win. Um... Okay, we'll do one more bit, and then we will probably invite our guest on, because he's sitting, uh, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the link. Raka Khan, the lawsuit has officially been dismissed. Now, Ken, Kenny Bolan talked about this in our show, uh, so I thought it'd be nice for you to have a go of talking about it this time. As we all know now, uh, Raka Khan is insane. So, in 2019, she was arrested for interference with child custody and aggravated kidnapping facilitate. Then she decided to turn the tables and sue nearly 1,000 people and organizations <laughs> for $3 billion total. Now, Trinisha Biggers, the real name of Raka Khan, uh, the name that you gave her, list of defendants included the enti entire states, like Texas, many law enforcement agencies, like the FBI, several university fraternities, as well as Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The Miz and Maurice, Heath Slater, Nikki Bella, but not Brie, Chris Benoit, who's been dead since 2007, Mark Jindrak, Panda Energy, that's uh, long since uh, uh, not involved with TNA, Home Depot, Florida Championship Wrestling, also defunct Steve Kern, the NWA as an entire organisation, Billy Corgan, the owner of the NWA, Deep South Wrestling, which is defunct Bank of America, Michael Jordan, the basketballist, several universities, Jim Cornette, Mick Foley, and New York City area energy company Con Edison, among nearly a thousand. So, you didn't get sued. I didn't get sued. Feel disappointed? I, well, I don't know how I missed that. I don't know how I missed that list, but I, I didn't get sued. I think she kind of liked me, to tell you the truth. But she was a... Uh... Kurt Angle could tell you a lot more about her than I could. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he was getting a divorce from his wife at the time, and I think he moved her in. Then he couldn't get her out because I think she started getting her mail there. And once they start getting the mail, they're very, very hard to kick them out of the house, even though their name is not on anything. So you got to be careful who, who you take in your house. And when you tell them to leave, they can, they might leave and they might not. But anyway, I, I didn't think that lawsuit would go anywhere anyway. It didn't. And the fact that she sued a thousand people speaks for itself. Oh no, 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 just not just people. Texas, the entire state of the state, the state. entire state of Texas was complicit in kidnapping her children that had already been taken away from her due to the fact that I presume she's mad. I I didn't know she had children. I really didn't. Well, maybe she kidnapped them. And, you know, she's passing them on to someone else, maybe. I don't know. Um, of just uh, your personal interactions with her, aside from the fact that you gave her the name Raka Khan, I mean, how often did you speak to her? Or was it basically you're doing this, see you later? 
No, I spoke to her. Every T. She was okay. She's a little bit silly. And she had she had some a uh, little bit of friction with the other knockouts, with the other girls there. They didn't much like her. And I think somebody got in her ear. They would watch her work and they would go up and tell her, well, you don't need to be doing that. And you don't need to be doing this. And she got it in her head. She was a bigger star than what she was. And she became a pain to work with, with the other girls. The other girls would come up to me and complain about her. So she was a walking, a walking uh, heat magnet. Uh, she would you, attract heat to her. Do you want to know where she came from? So I'm just reading the Wikipedia, the always reliable Wikipedia. Biggest entered the WWE Diva Search, but was eliminated during the top 25. And these, uh, eventually, uh, they actually did sign her to a development contract. She used to be a volleyball player and basketball player, which you could probably mm-hmm. tell because she's really tall. Yeah. Um, and then she was trained with Marty Gennetti for two months prior to reporting to Deep South Wrestling. So there you go, independent circuit. So she actually was wrestling for a couple of years first. I just didn't, I, maybe she was just a model or something that someone got out of a catalogue. I didn't know. I don't know where she came from. I didn't book her. I don't know who, who did book her. Remember, TNA <laughs> was, was fractured. So somebody comes in and said, oh, we're bringing this girl in. Okay, bring her in. And I looked at her because I was like me and Scott Demore. We kind of handled the knockouts. And when I say I go to the to the catering to escape, basically I had the the knockouts and I handled them. And I got uh Awesome Kong, got her over. Gail Kim got them over. Uh, and basically every girl that went through there, we only had like eight or nine, but they were more over than some of the guys, most of the guys we put, and I've said this a bunch of times, they never had hit a three rating in TNA. And we put awesome Kong versus Gail Kim in the main event on one of the uh, impact shows. And we did a 3.44, the highest rating or the second highest rating they ever did. The only one to beat that was Hulk Hogan when he, he came in the first time because it was big. But to have two people already on your roster and female do a 3.4 rating is because they believed Awesome Kong. Mm-hmm. And when I when I put Awesome Kong together, she's a big, big woman. And I told her, I said, I don't want you going off your feet till I tell you to. Because she was going out there and trying to work for these other girls. And I said, she, I think she went off her feet one time, I think. And she came back. I said, listen, I don't want you going off your feet again. Just don't. Do- I actually booked her as a female Abdullah the Butcher. And that's what she was. Mm-hmm. And when she came down to that ringside, people would stand up. Because she was such a novelty. And she was so good. And you believed her because she kind of transcended, is it real, is it fake? Because all her stuff looked good. Mm -hmm. I saw a Japanese match with her that Gail Kim gave me. If you didn't know the ins and outs of wrestling, you, you could actually sit there and say, this is real. They are really hitting each other. So, and that's what sold me on her. And Gail Kim actually gave me the tape. She said, you watch the tape? I said, yeah. I watched her. You want her? I said, yes. She, she said, when? I said, yesterday. Get her here. <laughs> Get her here as quick as you can. And and Awesome Kong, still a good friend. I still talk to her every now and then. But 
She is a, a great talent. And she went to WWE, but I think she got pregnant and she had to leave. But if she hadn't had to leave WWE, I think she would have been a huge, huge star. I'm just looking here. that uh, Awesome Kong and Raka Khan at one point was a tag team. Not for long. No, not for long. Taylor Wilde and Roxy. Taylor Wilde. There you go. Oh, hang on. And there was a, an Awesome Kong faced Raka Khan. We'll have to find out what that looks like one day. But um, do you know what? We... If if we're quick on this, we can sneak in one more quick news story then. So I'll do this. Sheamus recently did an interview with the Metro talking about how WWE has wasted the Brawling Brutes, which consists of Sheamus, Ridge Holland, and Butch, a.k.a. Pete Dunne. Uh, you watched SmackDown. I suppose your overall opinions on how the Brawling Brutes have been booked, in your opinion. Well, I kind of agree with Sheamus. I think they kind of – they just dropped them down to the middle – but that may have been where they envisioned the group being anyway. But they may have made a mistake on some things, but I don't see that that team actually being a, the main event. They're a good team, a great team. But how WWE rates these teams is they do the group testing. They put them in front of people and see how people react to them. And they react favorably toward them, but not overwhelmingly, I don't think. So somebody has to make a decision somewhere. Where do we put this team? So they put them in the middle and they may not like that. I don't blame them because any talent in WWE, they have to believe in their minds that they are as good as anybody in the main event. If you don't believe that you don't belong there. I don't take that away from them, but I think the, the brawling brutes are about where they envisioned them to be when they put them together. Right. I think from that, we are going to get our guest on. So one second, and then we'll throw it to Dutch. Well, who... well let me oh. let, let me explain who our guest is. Our guest is none other than the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller, who is a great talker. And I, I got a lot of stories from him. He is standing by. We'll be right back. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hated to put your own pause there. But I have a very special guest, a man that I met years and years ago that I got a lot of great stories from. And I thought at one time was the actually the smartest man in the wrestling business because he taught me a lot just by watching him. And his name is the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm great, Dutch. Uh, good seeing you, man. Uh, well, been a long time. thank you for being on the show. And uh, for the people that is unfamiliar with, with Ron, he comes from a long line of wrestling royalty. His father, Buddy Fuller, kind of, you know, pioneered pro wrestling in Tennessee. And his brother, Robert Fuller, also did a lot in the professional wrestling business. But Ron here, he went beyond just being a wrestler. He became an owner of a, a wrestling company. And how many wrestling companies have you owned, Ron? Uh, four. Four. And was your dad instrumental in talking you into that, or did you always have plans to do that? Well, I always had plans to do it, actually, Dutch. Uh... My grandfather, Roy Welch, the Roy uh, Welch, was the first guy uh, to become a owner of his own wrestling company in the Tennessee Territory back in the late uh, in the early thirties, nineteen thirty. Wow, you know, way that's way eight, back. That's that's eighty years ago. Oh yeah, way way back, man. My, my family goes back about a hundred years. I come from the oldest and the largest wrestling family on the planet. You know, it's not <laughs> just me and the Welches, uh, the Hatfields. 
I'm down in the Mobile area and along the Gulf Coast. Uh, they're part of the family. Uh, Jimmy Golden and his family are part of Welch's. They're Welch's. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so I come from a long line of uh, great history of wrestling. Way back 100 years. We go back 100 years. I didn't know you related to the Hatfields. Like the Hatfields yeah. and McCoy is the same bunch? Uh, well, it's kind of similar, you know. It was Their last <laughs> name were Hatfields. But when they started wrestling, they took the hat off of it, and they became the Fields brothers. It was Bobby, Don, and Lee, uh, Virgil Hatfield. Uh, you know, the, gosh, we got so many promoters and so many wrestlers, so many referees. <laughs> uh, it's it's just, uh, wow, uh, the family tree, man, that's uh, monstrous. Uh, you know, probably <laughs> uh, as many as 30, 30 <laughs> people uh, from my family have uh, been involved in wrestling. Well, uh, let me go back to when I first met you. I think I met you before you opened up the Knoxville Territory. Yeah. And I, I think, I think in, in the Knoxville Territory, I came from Atlanta, who's, I'm not going to get into it, but me and John Foley, we came there and worked for you there. You were just starting it. Right. And... Then I left. I think I went to Florida. And then I kept hearing things about Knoxville, Knoxville, Knoxville. And I don't know what you did there, but you must have booked it right. Because it was on everybody's talking list. And everybody wanted to go there. For one reason, it paid, it paid well. And the second reason were the trips were short. One of your longest trips was 100 miles, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was about uh, Johnson City. It was about 100 miles. Uh, and sometimes uh, we'd go to uh, as far as Hazard, Kentucky, which was about 140 miles. That mm -hmm. was the longest trip in the territory. There was a time there when we ran in West Virginia, but uh, the guys complained about it. Man, they got spoiled with those short trips, and they go, what yeah. are you booking uh, West Virginia for, Ron? It's four-hour drive, you know? So uh said, okay, guys, we'll just take it off. We'll just uh, we'll we'll not go you, there anymore. Yeah, but you were still working in, in those days, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Absolutely. And you were a you were a big heel? Uh I started out as a heel there when you guys, when you and John were working there in nineteen seventy-five. Uh yeah. I started I was a heel and I was working in the Memphis territory as a heel back in those days, just mm -hmm. going over there on Mondays. And you wait a minute. You drove from Knoxville to Memphis. Oh no! I had Jerry pay for my fare, fare man. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> hey, I have I have told people this, but back in the days when you had you worked Memphis and then you worked the Nashville territory, and Knoxville was a part of it, wouldn't you start on a Friday night in Huntsville and then do a TV? then drive to Memphis and do a morning TV and then drive to Nashville, do an afternoon TV, then to Chattanooga, do an, another afternoon TV and then do a house show. Is that true? Oh, oh yeah, man. Actually, I went there and worked with Robert one time in uh, 19, this is probably 1971. Uh, and they were running the studio, all studio television productions. Mm -hmm. And I uh, uh, flew into Huntsville, Alabama uh, we we went to Nashville. He was living in Nashville. Drove a couple hours to get back to Nashville. Went to bed about one o'clock in the morning, and he woke me up. And uh, it wasn't daylight. It was still dark, and he was packing <laughs> me on the back. He says, well, "Get up, we gotta go." So, what do you mean we gotta go? Where are we going? He goes, "We're going to Memphis. We got to be on Memphis TV." And, he, and I said, "Man, it's dark outside. I mean, you know, how long is that drive? Well, it's about three and a half hours, so you know. But <laughs> we got to get in the car, man. We got to go. So this is a true story. So we drive to Memphis, and uh, we get to Memphis, and there's snow on the ground, and uh, nobody shows up for that hour and a half TV show. Memphis had an hour and a half TV. Nobody showed up but me and Rob and Sputney Monroe and Norvell Austin." Mm -hmm. So we worked a two out of three fall tag match for the entire hour and a half television show in Memphis. And uh, as soon as we finished the TV, I go in there, man, I'm dragging, man. I said, well, what a start to the day, man. Well, this is terrible. 
<laughs> and he goes, well, well, we got to hurry up. He goes, hurry up, get your stuff off. So what do you mean, hurry up? He goes, we're on TV in Chattanooga. And I said, Chattanooga, man. I said, Rob, that's 400 miles. He goes, yeah, we got to go, man. He said, we won't even be able to eat if we don't get in, we're going to get dressed. So we went across the state to Chattanooga. We worked TV in Chattanooga. And, uh, and I went back in the dressing room and I'm saying, you know, do you do this every week, man? He goes, yeah, yeah. And he goes, hurry up, hurry up. I said, what do you mean, hurry up? And he goes, hey, we got the house show. We're working here in the house show. We can run and get some dinner before we work tonight here in Chattanooga. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I was coming out of Florida. I was working in Florida at yeah. that time. And uh, so uh, <laughs> we worked Chattanooga and uh, came back and then sat down and he says, uh, Hurry up, hurry up. I go, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, what, well, you got to be kidding me, man. I said, it's uh, it's 10 o'clock. I said, where are they going to have television that uh, that they're, they're doing TV at this time of night? Birmingham, he says. We're oh, on yeah. Birmingham TV. At, at midnight. At midnight. At midnight in Eastern time. I mean, in Central time. So you could go from the Chattanooga in Eastern time, make it there for, uh, for Birmingham so TV. So you worked four TVs. Four TVs and, and a house show. Yeah. Uh, th 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 actually, three TVs yep. and a house show in uh, in one day. And when we got back, uh, I was going to stay there with him for a week. You know, I said, well, I'll come and visit you for a week and hang out with you. And he goes, yeah, and that was the first day. We got back, and the uh, next morning, he woke me up, and then and, and I said, uh, no, 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 man, don't start it. Don't start it. And he goes, <laughs> no, 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 no. He goes, well, you know, we're just working in Memphis tonight, you know, I mean, whatever town it was. And I said, uh, no, Rob, I said, I think I'm going back, man. I said, I had enough of it yesterday. I said, I had a whole week's worth of work yesterday, man. And, no uh, kidding. I said, so uh, you worked, so it's three three TVs or four TVs and a house show. Yeah. Three so TVs five, and a house show. Five times and one day and how many miles? Oh gosh, man. Uh, well, it was uh, three, it was, Thousand it was probably miles 200 to Memphis, at least 200 to Memphis. It was 400 to Chattanooga, 600. It was uh, 150 to Birmingham. It's, Eight, <laughs> seven fifty, and uh, and another and back hundred fifty back to Nashville. So you know, about a thousand miles, thousand miles, one day. three TVs, and a house show. And one See, day, when you when you tell people a story like that, you can't believe it. Nobody can believe it. And I knew it. I know it happened. But by you telling me, I'm saying I couldn't do that. I, I would have left. I would have left in. Chattanooga, I think. I just said, screw it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Tell them I'm hurt. Tell them this. <laughs> Tell them that. I, I, I just can't do it. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. That, that that was the days, Dutch, you know, when everybody had the TVs. All those TVs were studio shows, you know, so everybody was doing them. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't like that. But what, in Florida, they weren't doing that. It's the same time yeah. frame. They were doing that uh, show in the Sportatorium and Gordon Soli and Sending that sucker around to all the cities in the state, uh, they they had uh, they were way way ahead of the Tennessee territory at that point. Mm -hmm. Now in Florida, I've always wanted to ask you this: Not only did you wrestle, you promoted West Palm Beach, right? How did that come about? Did you buy well, into it or? No, no, I didn't. I didn't own any part of uh, West Palm, uh, but. Uh, West Palm Beach had had uh, had no building there for many many years. They had an old polo arena and the and the uh, had a hurricane there and the arena blew the all the sides off and the top off and everything. And uh, they had built a brand new round uh, beautiful building. They held about eight thousand people. And uh, so my dad was involved with Eddie uh, in the promotion in Florida. And uh, they said Eddie uh, Graham. We'll get Eddie, this Graham. Eddie Graham. So uh, he said. He said, we're going to get in the West Palm Beach building and uh, and we want to know if you want to move there and, and become the local promoter for us. And uh, and I said, yeah, I said, that'll give me an opportunity to see what it's done, man. Of course, mm -hmm. I'll take the deal. I'll go, you know. And uh, so they sent me down to West Palm. 
They had never drawn 3,000 people in West Palm Beach before. It wasn't a big wrestling town, but that building was so beautiful. And we went in there and started running that building. Uh, within three months, we were we sold it out the first time in three months after being in there. It was at 8,000. Me and Bobby Shane wrestled for a Cadillac. Uh, oh, Bobby Shane, man. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that and uh, uh, so I got my feet wet. In the business, yep. learned how to do, you know, a little bit of promoting. I was putting out the cards. I was handling newspaper, doing that type of thing. You know, Ron, what I always liked about you is you always had enthusiasm. And I, I think that came from your dad, Buddy. I remember Buddy. I don't know if I've told you this story. Buddy was giving me a finish one time. And the other guy was going over. He was beating me. But he told it in such a way. He said, Dutch, I want, and a Dutch, by the way, your dad gave me the name Dutch Mantel. I know that. Yeah, I know yeah. that. Man. And I didn't know Dutch Mantel from Adam's House Cat, and I did a little research on him. But he was a shooter and made a lot of money in, in, the, in the carnival days, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But Taught the, my granddad but, to wrestle. Taught, <laughs> he, he trained my granddad, Roy. But the story, I, I want to tell you, he would he would start giving me the finish. And he said, Dutch, I want you to get in there and I want you to get some heat on him and I want you to beat his ass and I want you to slam him and do this and do that and play the crowd. And I'm listening. I'm going, yeah, yeah. And I'm getting excited by him. And then bam, bam. And then all of a sudden you miss something and he makes a big, he's throwing his arms around like this. You make a, he makes a big comeback on it. You're taking some bumps and all of a sudden he throws you in, they'll drop kick, you hook the ropes. He misses it. And then all of a sudden you go to slam him. He hooks a pot, small package on you. One, two, three. And he got me so excited. <laughs> Hell, I couldn't wait to get out there and do the job. <laughs> I said, let me out there. <laughs> but enthusiasm, just yeah, the way yeah. he sold it, and he was telling me. And I think part of that came down to you because that's the way you would give it. Because he cared about wrestling, uh, and he knew the business. Let me yeah. ask you this. And I think it was Mobile, Alabama. Didn't your dad help book that one time or own it? Dad, uh, Roy, Roy had Roy ran all Roy ran twelve states in the South at one time. The Tennessee wow. territory was in twelve states, and uh, so uh, he wanted to open up Mobile, Alabama. He sent my dad there. I was in the, I was about four years old, and mm -hmm. uh, he took us to Mobile, Alabama, and he created what was called the Gulf Coast Territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, wow, he just uh, he just ignited wrestling. Uh, TV was just getting on. I mean, TV was coming in, and it was becoming popular. He got on the biggest station in Mobile. Uh, he drew in Lad Memorial Football Stadium. They got yeah. the wrestling got so big that he ran an event with him against Mario Galento. That's and, right. Uh, they drew uh, over thirty thousand people in uh, nineteen fifty eight. Unheard of. Alabama. Unheard of. That was probably the biggest gate or the biggest crowd in the United States up to that time, right? It was probably close. I mean, they had Chicago and some of those cities up north, the big, huge cities that uh, they would draw sometimes of 40,000 in the, in the big uh, baseball stadiums or football stadiums. But it was by a huge, huge crowd for that day and time. It was, it was really a tremendous crowd. And they did a lot of stuff there that, uh, you know, uh, that he he ended up doing with all of his promotions. He went from uh, really from one state to another. But in this match with Mario Galento Dutch, it only lasted seven minutes. Uh, they they hard weighed each other. Uh, yeah, uh, explain both that. Both guys, both guys. My dad's nose was broke. Uh, his eyes were black for two weeks. He couldn't drive a car. Uh, Mario Galento had 72 stitches in his face from where dad had busted him. And uh, so that 40,000 people were, you le they left there as wrestling fans. Uh, I saw a picture one time when I was a kid and there was nobody sitting in the first three rows 
because the blood was flying back out of the out into the first three rows of ringside. Fans would, were getting bloody sitting there watching. See, this is the first time I'm hearing this story. And I'm enjoying it. I'm sitting here like a I'm sitting here like a fan myself. Said, then what happened? And then what happened? And then what happened? Okay, so the, the, they moved out of the the ringside seats to have the blood miss them. I'd, I'd heard it was a a brutal brutal match. Oh yeah, it, you know, and they have pictures of Mario Galento. If uh, fans want to find it on Google, I'm sure they're there. Of after that match, uh, with his eyes are black and he's got stitches and he's got he's got stitches in seven places on one eye, busting him seven times on the one eye. You know, I mean, so uh, it was crazy stuff. Uh, and there was a tremendous angle. I mean, uh, we could spend a, a bunch of time on this. I don't want to go too far into it, but uh, they worked an angle like this is what they were doing, Dutch. Uh, they uh, they they ran into each other on purpose, obviously, in a restaurant downtown. Mm -hmm. They got mm -hmm. into a fight in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they fought out of the restaurant, and they called the police. The police came down. And they recognized who they were. Uh, and the police wouldn't stop it. They they got back. They just backed off and watched them fight. Uh, Dad had a Cadillac, a brand new old Cadillac, man. This is way back in 58. Uh, and uh, Dad <laughs> said he grabbed Mal Malento by the back of the head and he slammed his face in the Cadillac so hard that it put a dent in the, in the hood of his Cadillac with Malento's face. You know, and that's the kind of angle they did getting ready for this. They had this type of deal. That's why they drew such house. And, uh, you know, fans really believed back in those days. Well, how could you not yeah. believe that? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> what they were doing, you know, you don't bust it. They, you don't see that anymore. Uh, when's the last yeah. hardware you ever saw, man? <laughs> the last what? The last hardware, hardware you ever saw. <laughs> oh, probably back in the late 70s, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, man. And uh, the guys today don't even know what the hard way is. Yeah. I mean, they get busted sometimes. So all you got to do is say, hey, when you hit something too hard and you start bleeding, it's called a hard way. But yeah. if a guy wants to hard way you, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an art to that too. And a guy showed me one time, he said, you take your finger and you pop them right there and that'll open it up. Yeah. Dad was great. And I was saying, and I, I was telling the guy I won't do that. I said, I don't know about that. <laughs> let's let's just go the old school thing. <laughs> no need to beat the crap out of me. I don't I don't need to believe it. The fans need to believe there it. There you go. <laughs> but but that always fascinated me, that big, big house that your dad drew in Mobile, Alabama at Lad Stadium. 30 something thousand people or whatever it was. It's a, and when I first heard that number, I said, bullshit. They didn't draw over 30 something thousand in Mobile, Alabama. The town's not that big. But it was, wrestling was over so strong. Did, did, did they have ratings then or not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean uh, like uh, Nielsen and Arbitron for, yeah, for, did, your, they, for your audience they did, ratings? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. They did. Uh, uh, the guy I ran when I got to, uh, after I ran opened up in Knoxville, I went down and bought out that the old Gulf Coast territory. Mm -hmm. Got on the same TV that my dad got on uh, to 20, 20 years earlier, and uh, with the same guy, a guy named CP Persons, was the general manager, and uh, we were able to take the wrestling uh, his his ratings back to point where Dad was. He told me your dad used to get an 80 share. An 80 share was like, uh, it was 80% of the homes that were watching TV were watching yeah. wrestling. Right. So, eight, you know, four out of five homes that had their TVs on were watching wrestling. And uh, Unbelievable. CP, CP said, I don't know, I've never, he said, I don't think anybody will ever do that again. We were able to do it again in two years once we were on that television station. We hit an 80 again. We used to do an 80 share in Knoxville. With the yeah, southeast, an eighty share in Knoxville. Eighty share in Knoxville for four years. We we had an eighty share or above. And let me to explain to all the people listening, Ron Fuller does not get the credit he deserves for not only doing all this other stuff in wrestling, but pure booking. You just kept it simple, straight up. 
and you touched on things that people would respond to. And that was your, that was your contribution. And you could, I like the way you say, if you do this, then we're going to come back with this. Then we, you were always like two or three weeks away. Yeah. And now when you gave a finish to the talent, they knew where they were headed. WWE, they may tell the top guys that, but other guys, they don't tell them nothing. They just say, go do this tonight. You don't need to know. But I really enjoyed working under your booking because it was easy. Not only was it easy, it made sense. And if I understood it, now I think I can make the people understand it. So uh, when you open, what year did you open Continental? Uh, Continental, uh, 1985. 1985, uh, went from Knoxville. Uh, we had a war in Knoxville in 1979. Had five guys in the crew that yes. decided they wanted yep. to, to take over wrestling. Let me talk about that a second. Now, you had a crew, and they all pulled a mutiny on you. Yeah, five of them. Oh, five of the yeah. crew. Five and who were they? It was uh, Bob Roop, uh, Bob Orton Jr., Ronnie Garvin, uh, yeah. Great Malenko, and Ron yep. Wright. Yep. And, uh, and Ron Wright was with them too, huh? Yeah, Ron Wright was with them too. And uh, they decided they wanted to see if they could take over Knoxville, basically. And uh, so, uh, and, uh, and, uh, so v eventually, uh, about six months after that war started, I, I got so uh, disenchanted with the whole situation. I'd spent five years there, built a tremendous territory, probably the best little territory in the history it was. of wrestling. It, it you know, was. and that's why you said a lot of guys wanted to come. I was turning down guys like Roddy Piper. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I had such a list of guys wanted to come in and get in there because of those short trips. That was key. And good money. They were making good money, taking and weren't going 100 miles a night. They were home by midnight. Everybody yeah. said, man, I, you know, we were home before midnight. Yeah, back in those days. Yeah, back in those days, yeah. We we went to, I went down to uh, Southeastern. I created, I took Southeastern Wrestling down to the Gulf Coast Territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I had uh, that business down there, I was able to build it uh, much bigger than Knoxville, actually. It got a lot better than Knoxville. I ended up buying Birmingham. I uh, ended up expanding down there into that area as well. So uh, uh, 1984, I got to thinking about, uh, I was seeing what was coming basically with WWE, mm -hmm. WWF at that time. Uh, that was before Junior got involved. But uh, I could see that, you know, somebody's going to get a national TV show. And so, uh, and, uh, and I was looking at the, the, the studio programs, I said, you know, uh, somebody's going to do big time, go big time. And uh, and I sat down, I had a partner, was Bob Armstrong. My brother was involved. Jimmy Golden was involved. We had a meeting and I said, guys, we want to, I want to take this company big time. I want to expand this all the way back into Knoxville, which we haven't been back at that point. We were six years out of going to into Knoxville at all. And, uh, so I said, uh, I want to uh, do um, a, a television right out of our major arena, uh, Boutwell Auditorium, Birmingham. I want to bring the trucks in, have five cameras. I, thought I laid the whole deal out, the whole concept. And I said, we want to change the name of the company from Southeastern to Continental. And I said, uh, we want to run from uh, Gulf Coast to Ohio. I said, we, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll be able to run from the Gulf Coast to Ohio. We were on 13 television stations in the South at that point. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, when Continental, that's where it came from. We did that show. Gosh, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was mind boggling. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. In your studio, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing a wrestling show and uh, you got seven, 8,000 fans in there. You can imagine what the difference is between your two or 300 in a regular studio. And now you got seven or 8,000 fans. Uh, so it just took but, off. But even back in those days, one thing that I noticed about those shows, the lighting was always good. Yeah. Because you watch AEW now, sometimes the lighting is horrible. And yeah. I know they can afford more than that. And when you tell me a show done 40 years ago had better lighting than AEW on some of their shows today, tells me something. Well, you so, had to have, you know, I mean, if you were going to do the show, to go to that expense, I mean, 
lighting perfect. Everything was perfect on that television show. Uh, actually, uh, Dutch got uh, I got into Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, the, my program got picked up by a company out of Houston. They loved it. They had never seen wrestling done that way. And they said, uh, Ron, uh, we, we want to take this international. So I was one of the first people to get into Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Far East and Middle East. And, uh, and then I even had a shot, man, at getting the national TV show before Vince got in New York. The same company took me to New York City and we sat down with NBC and talked to them about, uh, about uh, putting this show on. I didn't uh, know that. I didn't know yeah. about Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar and, or any of that. That's that's news to me. Yeah. So nothing so, nothing came of that or what happened? Oh well, you know, uh, we 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 went on for another three years. But uh, once I made the trip to New York, they wanted to take the show, and uh, and I didn't. I got to thinking about it because I was part of the NWA. In fact, in 1985, I was the vice president of the National Wrestling Alliance. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I did, I was afraid of uh, making all my NWA associates uh, scared that mm-hmm. I was going to take a, do what Vince did basically, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and I, I I didn't know I just backed out from taking the, the opportunity with NBC. I said it's too big a deal for us, you know, and uh, made excuses. But I really didn't do it because uh, I was concerned that. My relationship with all the NWA guys was going to deteriorate, you know, and uh, I wish now, looking back, man, if I'd oh, taken yeah. that opportunity, uh, it would be just like old school. Oh, yeah. Uh, wrestling wouldn't have changed. It wouldn't have changed like it do you watch? Do you watch wrestling now? No. <laughs> I'm going to watch <laughs> the show. I haven't watched a wrestling show in uh, 20 years. Yeah. That's about like me. If I'm not involved with it, I don't watch it because I see things they do and I just say, well, whatever. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's changed so much. It's, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Didn't you, didn't you make a phone call to Vince where y'all had words? Uh, I worked Are with you? Vince's dad with senior 1973. Yeah. I was in, uh, in Florida and, uh, Eddie Graham put his Florida tape into New York City. Uh, he mm-hmm. was really close with Vince Senior, Vince McMahon Senior, and uh, Vince had another. He had some people that were trying to get on that TV, and he talked to Eddie Graham. He said, uh, "Can you send me your Florida tape, Florida TV?" And so uh, Eddie said, uh, "Yeah, I'd be glad to do that." You know, he said, I, "I don't." He said, "I don't have to worry about you being opposition to me," you know. And it was a smart idea for Vince. You know, he, he backed himself up and he didn't have to worry about, you know, somebody trying to steal his town or his territory. And so, uh, you know, and him and Eddie were good friends. And uh, so in 1973, uh, they started sending Florida talent into Madison Square Garden. All mm-hmm. of the Madison Square Garden shows around 1973 were uh, had at least one Florida guy on all of those shows. Uh, so I went on one of those shows uh, into uh, Madison Square Garden. Jack Briscoe had been there two weeks, two two shows prior to me, and uh, you know, so uh, that uh, that uh, that whole thing up there in New York, uh, it turned out to be. I was really tight with uh, with Vince Senior. Vince uh, mm-hmm. Senior was not a part of the National Wrestling Alliance, but he came to every one of those meetings in the in the in the August of every year out in Vegas, they had the national wrestling Alliance meetings and Vince was at every one. He was well liked by everybody. I got an old picture. One of those old NWA get togethers. They had all the old timers on it. Buddy is on it. Your dad's on it. Eddie yeah. Graham's on it. Roy was Nick, there. Nick, Roy was on Nick, that picture, I think. Who, Nick. Roy. Yeah. Okay. My granddad, Roy. Yep. Had about thirty guys there, and I could name about I don't know twelve or fifteen of them. Some of them I couldn't name, but they were all dressed up in suits, and they're having this this big meeting. So, I mean, the history of this business still fascinates me. How it got from then to where it is today. Yeah, 
So yeah. let me let me bring you ahead. You you were running running Continental, the Knoxville territory. I'm sorry, and you could see Vince moving. So you sold it. Yeah, yeah. To I, a TV guy in Montgomery. In Montgomery, yes, Montgomery, and his Alabama. Name, David Woods. Yes, David Woods. You worked there. No. You went there, son. Not there, long. After, the, after I was there, after I had left and yeah, sold not out. Not long. Not yeah. long. I yeah. said, yeah. screw it. Well, he the had whole, no idea. He didn't it, know anything about the business, yeah, you know. The whole structure, the whole structure changed. And they brought in another booker. And I don't guess he much liked me or whatever. And, but before he gave me my notice, I gave him mine. I right. just I just, I just walked out, right. and I'm thinking right there. This David Woods, a good guy, he knew the TV business, but he didn't know the wrestling business. Yeah, and I don't. How long did he last? He didn't last long, did he? Oh no, no, man. I guess maybe a year, about a year, and he he was out of business. So yep. And when I sold there, Dutch, I went and started my last company. I went back to Knoxville and I started a company called U.S. Stay, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, did it uh, in the ballroom from the Knoxville Coliseum and uh, had Gordon Soley as my commentator. A uh, good little show uh, had uh, Armstrong, Bob, and his boys were all good workers at that point. And uh, uh, Bill Dundee and uh, Buddy Landell, uh, uh, Doug Furness. You ever, yeah. you ever know Doug Furness? Oh, Doug I know him Furness, well. Tremendous talent. Knew, tremendous knew him talent. well. You know, I uh, work with him. I worked with him in Continental, I think. Yeah, you probably did. It's when he started. That's when and then started. W and because he was a University of Tennessee football player. Yes. And was jacked to the gills. Oh. He was unhumanly strong. He was the strongest man in the world, literally. He was really literally the strongest man in the world. He's one of the only humans to ever squat with a thousand pounds. He squatted a thousand pounds. He squatted a thousand pounds. Unbelievable. I mean, he was just. If I had a whistle, if I had a whistle and a flag, I'd have to, I'd have to throw the flag <laughs> on that one. And I'd have to go to Google. And I'd I have, think you'll I'd have find to it there. Anyway, USA, I ran that company for six months. And, uh, and by that point, Vince was pretty much, he had knocked everybody pretty much out of the business. And, uh, and I could see the writing on the wall. And so, uh, I just uh, I, I sold that business to David Woods. I sold mm -hmm. USA to him. He just changed the name of it to uh, to his company and uh, went on working with uh, his, with it as Continental. So uh, you know, uh, uh, and then I and then I quit. I just I got out of wrestling and uh, I actually got into hockey, man. I yeah, I've that. already told the I've already told a lot of the the hockey stuff on, on the show. But just for the fan, what did you pay for that franchise when you first got in for the Nashville hockey team? $25,000. And you sold it two years later? I sold it. Yeah, we had to sell it two years later because we put a second team in. The second year, we, we bought another team, started a team in Cincinnati. And the league said, you got to sell one of your teams. And so, you sold uh, the Nashville team. We sold the Nashville team for uh, how much? Uh, Seven hundred and fifty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable! Yeah. Now, folks, let me tell you, hockey in Nashville is like I don't know. It's un. It was unheard of at the time, right? Oh yeah, yeah. They they had had they had had the team there back in the sixties. You know, but uh, they never. It was just not popular. It what was. Did they, what did they? What did they predict you would draw in Nashville? Oh my gosh, a couple man. hundred people. Oh yeah, the, some of the guys said five hundred people. I, I had people. Uh, some of the news media first press conference we had. Uh, I asked. <laughs> I said, "What do y'all think we're going to draw?" And uh, I got anywhere from a uh, thousand to five hundred people. That was it. I mean, you know, they were, they said, they were all kind of giggling and laughing about this, you know. Like, yeah. they, this guy's going to try to bring hockey back here. Um, but uh, they weren't laughing the first night, though, opening night. Yeah, okay. Tell the fans how you promoted the opening of the team 
on the billboards. Oh, okay. And I remember this. I was in Nashville at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I saw the billboards. What did you do? Well, we did, uh, you know, we didn't use the old small billboards. We went to the freeway billboards, the big, big boy billboards uh, that were on all the freeways there. And uh, the team was called the Nashville Knights. Uh, obviously, uh, the logo had a, had a, like a face mask of, an, of a knight in the armor. Uh, and uh, so it had uh, two sticks that crossed behind the behind the mask, and uh, and it had uh, the eyes. Uh, the eyes behind the mask were the whole key to to making getting people's attention when they went down the road. And uh, so, uh, and I had, to, and I wanted to do something that they'd never done there. Or maybe it had never been done anywhere. I don't know at this point. But I w asked the uh, uh, billboard company. I said. Uh, I want to put an extension out of the top of the billboard. So what do you mean? Have something stick out of the top of it? I said, yeah, I want the sticks. The sticks will be crossed behind the mask. I said, like I want the hockey sticks. sticks. Hockey sticks. I said, I want the yeah. top of the hockey sticks to send 10 feet, 10 feet out the top of the billboard. And they were like, God, we never done that. Do you know, are you, are you serious? Are you? And I said, it's, <laughs> think about the impact, guys. I mean, nobody, you just said it. No, you never seen it before. You know, so uh, then uh, they got to talking to me and they said, well, you know, they had some ideas for the billboard. I already knew what I wanted to do. I said, uh, you know, uh, I said, I want to take uh, I want to take uh, uh, two months to get this whole billboard put together. I said, I just want to put the eyes up there to begin. Yeah. I just want that's two what, eyes. That's what I remember going down yeah. the road and I'm driving. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and I see this billboard and I went, what the elf is that? Yeah, because it made everybody think. Yeah, I mean, where it, is it, this going? And then maybe a week or two later, there was another. You added another thing, and I went, "Whoa!" Now I got another clue. Now I'm thinking more. And now, finally, about six weeks in, it's revealed that it's a hockey player, and now you're ready to open the season. No, yeah. no telling how many fans you made with just the billboard. Oh yeah, just the billboards. I think uh, I think it really helped us dramatically to do that. But uh, as you say, you got to looking for the billboard. Yes. Yeah. You know I mean, what happens is you saw the eyes, and then you go, "Wow, what the heck is all that about?" And then then we came with the mask. All of a sudden, there's a mask in front of the eyes, and then we came with the sticks out the top of the billboard. And by that time, you know, then we said coming such and such a date and everybody knew basically what it was hockey uh, so, that uh, company was lamar i advertised with billboards yeah, I, 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 one. I used to yeah. use those things uh in all my companies uh, uh you know uh dutch uh, i used how much, them in how much was it how much was it to rent a billboard in those days uh a regular billboard I used to buy, what you did is you buy a number of them. You don't buy just one billboard. I mean, obviously you wouldn't get much of much emphasis if you just had one, one billboard, but uh, uh, you could buy the old small billboards. I bought my buys sometimes. I bought one when I went to the Gulf coast, I wanted to use billboards because I had done them in Knoxville before. And uh, I bought uh, billboards in three States. I bought billboards in Montgomery, M Mobile, uh, the Dothan area. Uh, and I bought, uh, I think I bought a uh, hundred billboards and I paid about uh, $25,000 for a hundred mm -hmm. billboards, but they were there. I worked a deal. You normally got about a month. I got, uh, two months for the price of one. And, uh, and it was always worth my money. Billboards were a tremendous way to advertise. They have big impact. But uh, once I went to not to to uh, hockey and I got on the freeway billboards, now I got you're getting everybody. And I put yeah. them on forty. I put them on. You got all those freeways running through Nashville, right? So I had those billboards on all of those freeways, so that uh, they, they were very, they were very very effective. Now the the experts, the paper, the sports editors, they said, ah, you. You might draw 500 people, maybe a thousand. Your opening night in Nashville, what did you draw? Uh, 6,000. 6,000 people. <laughs> and it only holds eight, right? Yeah, it only held eight. Yeah. 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 I almost sold out the building the very first night. And what were they saying then? 
Oh, they were nuts. I mean, you know, uh, they they had all laid back. Uh, they didn't want to really get involved. You know, nobody. Yeah, well, it ain't gonna happen, and all that stuff. It was a. It, it was just <laughs> nobody saw it. Nobody could picture that this is going to happen. And then, uh, wow, the first night we had to, we had to hold the game up for forty five minutes because we had more people on the outside of the building than we had inside because we weren't yeah. prepared. Well, I didn't think we were going to have 6,000. I figured maybe – I didn't know. You know, and people would say, well, how many do you think? I, and then my, I was being honest. I, I have no idea. No. I have no idea. We're, we're doing all this to get it to go, but we won't – how am I going to know till we do it? And yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, but uh, it uh, it just exploded, man. It, it became huge, and, uh, and it helped minor league hockey. And in no fact – No kidding. Yeah. Oh, tell, tell the story about – the minor league hockey people told you that you couldn't have music playing before the introductions or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And you introduced, you introduced the spotlights, the music, and you say starting at left forward or whatever that position is. And you'd put the spotlight and they, they would skate out there. You introduced that, that they adopted and then wrestling adopted. Oh, everybody adopted it. All indoor arenas of Actually, basketball. You, everything. you took you took your wrestling experience, applied it to hockey, promoted it, publicized it, made it bigger than life. You made it a show, and then the people came. Yeah, you know, and that, and that was the thing when I first watched my first hockey game. Uh, it was the dullest thing I'd ever seen. Nobody introduced the players. Nobody, uh, you know, the players would skate out. They'd run around in circles. And, uh, you know, it was like, <laughs> and I watched it, and I was like, Bob Polk. You probably remember Bob Polk. Yeah, oh, yeah. My oh, yeah. partner, Bob Polk, uh, took me to this first live hockey game. And I watched the, the beginning of it. And, you know, and they only had about a 1,000 people. And I was like, hey, this ain't me. And Bob, I don't see nothing here, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but, and then thank God, uh, sometime during the – about the end of the first period, they had a fight. And when the fight started, everybody in the building stood up. And I looked at Bob and I said, well, I can – I can identify with this part of it, man. This we mm-hmm. might work with this. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, we just we did things uh, so much differently. We used to play Bob Armstrong's music uh, in Nashville when we did Bad that. to the Bone. Bad to the Bone, darken the building, put the spotlights and, all around. And the peop- people, people all bone. stood up. People all stood up, and then the NHL. There was two NHL guys from National Hockey League teams. Uh, that came, they wanted to see because I was a wrestler and they heard that I was in the minor league hockey and what's he going to do to this stuff, right? I guess that probably was their idea. Yeah. And uh, after they watched this intro at the end of the first period, I was in my office and they came in and uh, wanted to see me. I invited them into the office and they said, hey, you know, well, who in the hell do you think you are? And I mean, like, I'm like, well, what, what's wrong, guys? And uh, <laughs> this ain't hockey. They they said, uh, you know, you don't do hockey like this. I mean, he goes, uh, you introduced the players. I said, hell yeah, I introduced the players, man. Did you mm-hmm. see the crowd there? You know, uh, they, they had all these. And then, and then I finally just said, guys, uh, you know, I said, how many people were sitting down when this was going on at the introduction of the game? And uh, they looked at each other, right? You know, and they and, and I said, I, "Were y'all sitting down?" And they had to looked at each other again. Like, <laughs> well, no, actually, we had to stand up because we everybody was standing <laughs> up, right? You know, we couldn't see, <laughs> right? So I no. said, I said, uh, I said, I tell you what, I goes, uh, uh, you know, I didn't buy into an NHL. Uh, you know, I didn't buy an NHL team. I said, I just bought into the minor league. And I said, I got a feeling, guys, after seeing this crowd and after seeing what happened in the intro out there, I said, uh, this is going to be hockey in the future. This is where you're going to go. And the National Hockey League adopted that. Oh. And everybody in the world that had a team sport kind of introduced yep. sim- similar to that, and it caught on. And it all yep. started – with a little hockey team in Nashville. That's it. That's it. We were the first ones to ever do anything like that. Then uh, changed hockey, changed hockey. Uh, and it and changed did, basketball. And, and I was going to ask you about that. You were a college basketball player. 
Right. Didn't you play your first year at Clemson? Yeah, sure did. Freshman but Clemson team. wasn't your style, was it? Oh, no. Well, the, it didn't have many girls. The problem were <laughs> Duchess. Uh, uh, I went there. I went there. They recruited me on a week. It was spring break, and there was nobody on campus. So me and a guy from uh, – uh, another guy came out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they were recruiting, and uh, it was just the two of us. Stayed in the dorm room. There wasn't nobody on campus. Didn't know any. Didn't get to see what it was all about, you know. But we both talked to each other and said, you know, well, why don't we just come here? And uh, so he was a nice guy. We end up going there. And then uh, after about the first week of school started, I got. I asked around. I said, "Where's all the girls? What's the deal here?" You know, and they said, "Well, this is a military. You know, it's a military school. You know, there's only eight hundred girls." Yeah, yeah it used <laughs> to be. Yeah, yeah, it used to be a military school. So, uh, wow, it just. You know, I I made it through the first year, and then I wanted to go somewhere else. So I went to Miami, which uh, it fitted my my what I was looking for a lot better than Clemson. And what position did you play? I played center. Okay. Center. Yeah. You told me a story one time that your dad wanted you to have an altercation on the court with an opposing player that he wanted to tape and play it back. What's that about? Well, he told me uh, he came as the last game of this last game of my my career there, and uh, and the center he wanted me to get was a guy named Artis Gilmore who became oh, a God. huge he was star. Big. Right, he was NBA star, right? And uh, so, and he had already seen me play against Artis Gilmore in Jacksonville. Uh, he came to watch that game. And uh, so he came to this last game with Miami and he took me out to breakfast and he said, you know, you're going to be playing. This is the last game you're ever going to play. And he goes, uh, you know, you could do, there's something you could do tonight that you would be, you'd get the most publicity that anybody has ever gotten in all of basketball history. And I was like, uh, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, he goes uh, I, you know, it, it's a simple deal, boy. He goes, you know, you this is your last game. They can't do nothing to you uh, if you were to do it. And he says, you got that big artist Gilmore, you know, that you're playing against. He goes, how, how big was he? He's he seven was, two, he was about he? seven two. He was about seven two, maybe two, hey, close to 300 pounds. Yeah. He was a big boy, you know. And uh, so uh, he said uh, – why don't you, uh, you know, somewhere in the game, he goes, uh, you know, you catch him running, you know, you know, you're always running back and forth down the court. He says, why don't you just stop about mid court somewhere? And when he comes running, just step right in front of him and scoop him up and slam him right on the mat, right on the court. You know, and I was like, are you kidding, Dad? Are you serious? Like, what a joke. You know, they I don't know what they're – he said, I know what they'll do. They, you'll be the biggest story across the country. They ever show yeah. it in every outlet in America. He mm -hmm. goes, you're going to be a wrestler? I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, Dad. And you know that. I've been training for it all my life, right? And uh, he says, uh, you're going to be a wrestler? There's the way you get it kicked off, boy. <laughs> and, like, and he and he was and he was he right. Made, he made a good point. He, he certainly good, did, you know. And, and I and I thought I spent a, I spent the you know the whole day considering it, man, thinking about man, now I, that that's not a bad idea. But oh uh, well. Anyway, I didn't do it. Let me tell you a, a interview I saw one time. I think it was Super Bowl three. And they interviewed Ernie Ladd. So there's out doing this interview, I guess, NBC announcer. And they wanted to talk about the game. Well, Ernie didn't want to talk about the game. Ernie wanted to talk about his wrestling career. And he had a match coming up at Madison Square Garden against Bruno. And he was talking about Madison Square Garden, Bruno, yeah, this, that, and the other. And the guy said, well, what about the San Diego Charter? Well, Bruno, Bruno, and he, yeah. he kept going. He gave it the most publicity it could have gotten because he was on a national telecast well, talking yeah. about his debut in Madison Square Garden. And I, I'm going to see if I can pull it up. It's got to be somewhere because the network, you know, they hated it. But they oh, couldn't yeah, do sure. nothing. 
they couldn't do nothing about it because Ernie was going to do what he wanted to do anyway. Did you ever work with Ernie? I sure did, man. Uh, three times. Three times I worked with Ernie. Uh, Watts had him over there in Mid-South. Yeah. Worked for Watts in Mid-South. And, uh, and we were right next to Mid-South. Man, I always had a great relationship with Watts. And uh, so uh, I never had to worry about Watts running into my towns or he didn't have to worry about me. And uh, so I asked him, I said, uh, can you send me Ernie for, for a show in Mobile? And I said, I'll work a show for you and with Ernie and, and wherever you want me to work. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll do that for you, Ron. And uh, wow, we booked uh, Ernie in uh, Mobile, uh, me against Ernie in Mobile. And uh, I'd never met him. Uh, and what a great guy Ernie was, man. Oh, yeah, he was. Super dude, he was. And, uh, wow, he went out. He put me over. I went over to uh, New Orleans and put him over. You know, and uh, it was like, uh, you know, that was the way business was run back in those days. And it was yeah. great, man. It, uh, you know, had and, so, and, so many guys and, you could deal with. In New Orleans, you was in the Superdome? Yeah, I think it's when, uh, yes, in the Superdome. Unbelievable building. Oh, heck yeah, man. Yeah. Think, I've been in there. I was there for the University of Tennessee when Doug Furness played football for the national championship against the University of Miami. That was about yeah. 19. I can't remember what year it was. But the national championship game was uh, Tennessee and Miami. At the Superdome. In the Superdome in New Orleans. And uh, I went about, to the game. Seats about, seats about 75,000, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big, big it's a oh, big experience. Big. When I was there for Watts, I think we had, I don't know, I'm gonna say 20,000, 15, but with 15 to 20,000 people in that building, it looks empty. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally it's, empty. It's a big, big building, that's for darn sure, man. Big son of a gun. And that's where Muhammad Ali walked in one night. That's Muhammad Ali. Uh, you know, we didn't have the little cameras then. Uh, we'd all got a picture. But he walked in, and he was shaking hands with everybody. And Ali, I thought he would be a little bigger than what he was. He's really not that big. Not to me, but because right. we're used to seeing the 330-pound oh, yeah. guys in the or whatever. But he was kind of tall, but he wasn't, you know, thick. But And the first thing he said was, I want to see that dirty white boy. <laughs> that's who he had saw the name and uh -huh. he wanted to see the dirty white boy. And what was his name? Tony, what? Tony, Tony Anthony. I mean, uh, Tony yeah. Anthony. Yeah. And that just flattered Tony Anthony to death. Oh, I bet. Oh yeah. And he wanted to see him. I guess they took a picture or, or whatever, but he was very nice. And I don't know what he came down there for. I think he made an appearance or something whatever he did, but, and sometimes people walk into dressing rooms. I mean, huge, huge stars. I think wrestling kind of gets the, kind of gets the reputation is, ah, nobody watches that. The stars watch it. Yeah. And they, and they pay attention to it. So, and look at all the people WWE have introduced into the wrestling business the media influencers like Logan Paul and it, and it works. And the thing about Logan Paul is he's an athlete. He can learn what they need to teach him. And I think he learned very well because I've watched a couple of his matches. That guy looks like he'd been training for five years and I don't know who trained him, but they did a damn good job in training him. So did you ever want to go to WWE? Elf. Um, once I quit uh, and sold my USA territory in 1988, uh, I was burnt out on the business. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I had run uh, companies uh, since 1975, been not just a wrestler, but a promoter and a booker. And, you know, uh, and I'd had at this point about 14 years in the business. Uh, and I was like, uh, wow, I think this is all I want to do. And bad enough. I would have never gotten to hockey, actually, probably, you know, except by accident. Just got, you know, I had Bob Polk said, you know. But Bob Polk kind of talked you into that, right? 
Yeah, yeah. He well, he talked me into going to the first game, and then uh, and then once we saw the little fight there, and uh, we went to, I said, let's go into the office here and find out about this game. Where where does this come? Well, who's in it? What's the league? All that stuff. And it was the smallest hockey league in the country. That yeah. hockey league now is the biggest. Wow. The, the East Coast. It was called the East Coast. I think they still call it the East Coast, but they run in Alaska. They got teams mm -hmm. in Alaska. So, uh, you know, it had, it had four teams and they weren't doing, uh, they weren't averaging 2,000 a game. And, um, you know, let, we, let me explain who Bob Polk was. Bob Polk was a Knoxville native and he worked for some of the buildings or something. That's how you met him, right? Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. guys formed a little business or got into business together, and then you became friends. And now he talked you into going to that hockey game just to show you. He didn't tell you what he what his plans were to start off with, right? He no, just no. wants you to see it. Yeah. And he and when you saw the fight, you were hooked. Yeah, yeah. That's that's about all it took, man. It was uh, you know, I gotta tell you about a fight in there. One fight. OK, uh, so once I got wanted to get involved and went to the office and they turned me on to where you go up in Virginia and you meet so and so. He's the head of the league. No deal. We went up there and met him. And uh, the first thing he says, he looked at me and he goes, wow. He goes, what do you do? I said, mm -hmm. well, I used to be a wrestler. And he goes, oh, geez, you want to get a team and you're you ain't going to have a bunch of goons. Are you right? I mean, if, if we give you a team in this league. You, you're not going to have a bunch of fight. It's not going to be wrestling, is it? And I said, no, I don't, you know, I don't, I just want to get in your business, man. I don't want you yeah. getting in mine, you know? So, uh, <laughs> they, so, so he, they were so concerned about the team, you know, fighting and the whole deal. Right. So, uh, and uh, so then when I hired a coach, I didn't know anything about hockey, so I didn't know where to go looking for a coach. And when I hired a coach, finally, his name was Archie Henderson, and he was a Canadian. Uh, out of the Ox same place, Archie, his name was like Archie Goldie, like the Mongolian Stomper, except mm – -hmm. uh, and he was from Calgary, uh, just like Stomper was. And uh, so I hired Archie Goldie. And, uh, and I finally told my – the commissioner kept saying, who's your coach? Who's your, you got to have a coach, Ron. You got to get the guy. And uh, so then I finally said, I got the guy. And he says, who was it? Who is it? And I said, it's Archie Henderson. He goes, oh, no, Ron. He goes, he's the biggest <laughs> goon in hockey. He goes, he fights all the time. He goes, oh, no, you got the wrong guy. I said, well, it's too late now. I like the guy. I, I'm not hired him, right? So anyway, first game we played, we played against Knoxville, state rivalry, in state rivalry. One of the mm -hmm. reasons I, I said this will be successful, you know, we got Nashville against Knoxville. First game we go to, uh, we get out there and, uh, and uh, you know, and I and I, I told my coach, I told Archie, I said, now we don't want no fights or anything. Archie wanted, we want to, we want to keep this thing, uh, you know, play hockey. Uh, first, first period. They get into the biggest hockey fight I'd ever seen. I'd never seen a fight <laughs> on ice in which there wasn't enough referees. Usually they got the three referees and they got to be, they can kind of get it started out. Of, this started out with two guys, then another two got into it, and then another two got into it. And now the, the last four on the ice got into it, right? And uh, there ain't enough referees to stop them up. So there's fighting everywhere, but the building's standing up. I mean, the yeah. people are like, this is unbelievable. What, where was this, Knoxville? Or? This was Knoxville. We went yeah. to took the team to that from Nashville to Knoxville, opening night, first game, and the, you, Ron, don't have any problems. The guy, the commissioner, we don't want to have any problems, the whole deal. So this fight starts out as two guys. It goes to four guys. It goes to six guys. It goes to ten guys. All the everybody on the ice is fighting, and finally they get it squared off and kind of separating the guys. And the two goalies drop their drop their gloves and skate to center ice, and the two goalies start fighting. 
I'm like, oh, I'm up in the stands. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. This you is you knew they were they were going to kind of roast you on this. What oh, the of hell? course, right. And then you know, so I'm 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 like, oh, and I'm I'm saying, pull them apart, get it over, stop it, stop it. And then I look, <laughs> and on the far side of the ice, they got the two teams sitting side by side. They got the glass separating them. Yeah. My coach Archie Henderson, I look, he stands up over and reaches and gets the other coach and drags him over. Over the top of the glass and starts pounding him. And <laughs> how, how long did this fight go? How long did this fight go on? Oh, it went. Uh, it seemed like it went thirty minutes. It was just like <laughs> it was like never going to end. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell them? Right, the wow. league, you know. And the next day, man, they I got the call. You know, guy says, Ron, <laughs> the commissioner goes. What did we ask you to do? <laughs> I said, God, I'm sorry, man. I, I, I wasn't out there. I couldn't stop it, you know. And, uh, he goes, that's exactly what we didn't want, you know. But, uh, geez, we, uh, we, 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 they, they forgave us for everything because we, we, we averaged eight, close to eight thousand a game, man. It was like so. You were out drawing, You like were actually out drawing the real franchises. Yeah. The NHL, NHL franchise. We, we were out drawing some NHL. Chicago and Detroit and all those yeah. teams. Yeah. Let me ask you that you told me this one time that you have, don't you have th two intermissions in Yeah, two in intermissions. Hockey? Okay. Yeah. The first one, you do something, entertain the people. And the second one, you had one one time where if somebody could stand at center court, I think. And yes, shoot right. a hockey puck and get it through an area about this big. Right. They would win a brand new Cadillac. Cadillac. Budget rent a car. Yeah. I went and to they budget rent a car. Give them, <clears throat> and you asked them one time, <clears throat> guys, if somebody gets this, is, isn't that an expensive deal? And what did they tell you? Yeah, they said, uh, they said they knew more about it than I did, you know, and they yeah. said, uh, they said, you can insure the game. I said, what do you mean you can insure the game? And they go, well, <laughs> you can, we can pay them a flat fee, and uh, if it ever happens, that's all we'll owe. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, so we can, uh, everything else uh, is paid for. The car will be paid for. is no big deal, right? So uh, if somebody makes it, the insurance pays it. The insurance paid yeah. for the car. I never heard that before in my life. Yeah. It was a hell of a deal. Uh, so it I, didn't cost them anything if somebody made it. No, no, it cost them what they did spent was five thousand dollars for the promotion. Now that's what they spent for the insurance. They had to pay us though. That was the deal. That was the great deal about hockey. The deal that the deal that made hockey so much better and so much more profitable than wrestling is you could get somebody to uh, sponsor everything, mm -hmm. everything. So. Uh, they paid five thousand dollars for the insurance. They paid us ten thousand for the promotion, and uh, so for fifteen thousand, they got a year's worth of advertising. All those games, eight thousand. It was uh, during the course of the year, about uh, two million people, close to two million people. So for five thousand dollars, they got a year coverage. Yeah, they got to every game. They played the game every okay. every had, night. Had you ever heard about that before? No. No. Hey, hey, James, come on here a second. Have you ever heard anything like that, James? I've heard of insurance for like you know if concerts or something like that don't don't happen for whatever reason, entertainment insurance like that. But I've never heard of competition insurance like that. No, I've never heard of it either. He's actually telling me a lot of things today that I've never heard. Anyway, I right, put Ron back on. Oh, you just keep talking to Ron, I'll disappear. Okay, Ron, this is one of the most enjoyable interviews I've ever done. Where is Ron? I don't see him. I'm here. There you are. He didn't need to my man. On the screen. He didn't have you on screen. I've enjoyed this interview more than I've done any other interview. Because you've told me some things that I don't even know. And... Uh, and I, that, that last question I ask you, I'm sitting here, I'm racking my brain, saying, what is that question I want to add? And then it will pop in, and then you're talking about something else, and it'd pop out. So well, let me ask you something. Who was the best, 
worker you've ever worked with? Wow, man. He's worked with a lot of great ones. Uh, Nick Bockwinkle. Yeah. Maybe Nick Bockwinkle set definitely up in the top five. Uh, no, the. Um, Did you work? You ever work Houston? No, I never worked in Houston. I always wanted to wish I had. Wish I had it. St. Louis. Oh my, yeah, St. Louis, uh, forty times. Really? Yeah. Chicago. Chicago. Never Chicago? worked in Chicago. No. St. It's Louis funny. was on the MWA. That's the only reason yeah. I got in there. Uh, it's funny that Chicago, St. Louis, and Houston were all like outliers. They didn't have just one territory stocking them. They would have one territory for the majority of their guys, but they would bring the big top talent in the country in. That's what made them different, and I call them out outliers. So you never made Houston? No, I never worked for Bosch. I always – and I knew Bosch very well because he was part of the NWA. Yeah. So, you know, uh, see him every year in uh, in, Ju in July or August when they had the meetings out in Las Vegas, but uh, never worked for Paul. How many uh, times you work with Flair? Oh God, jeez, <laughs> Dutch. Uh, I'd I'd guess uh, forty, maybe. How many? Forty, yeah. maybe forty times. What about the Briscoes, Jack. How many times you work with him? Oh, uh, I didn't work against Jack a whole lot uh, because uh, Jack was a baby face. I was a baby face during the time frame that I was in Florida. Yeah. So uh, I worked with Jack. Uh, at least, uh, I'd say five times at least. I worked with him three times in Memphis alone. Uh, we sold out Memphis three times straight. Uh, and in two weeks, back to back, uh, we sold out Memphis in 11,200 people. Uh, the, one of those days, where one of those shows sold out in one day. They were selling mm. band sale tickets, and they sold out the, the second one in one day. Uh Jack, uh, what a great worker Jack was, though. My goodness, mm -hmm. man. Uh, and uh, and he kind of took me under his wing when I went to Florida as a young guy. He took a liking to me, and he he spent time with me, quite a bit of time with me, uh, talked to me about all my matches, watched all my matches, came and gave me all this advice, told me when I got uh, sent to St. Louis. He said, Ron, that's the way I got to be champion. He said, uh, they're grooming you. I think they're grooming you for the big belt. He goes, uh, how many times – he's asked me, how many bookings you got for 73 in St. Louis? And I, and because of much of it used to book you out a long time in advance. And I, I think I told him uh, five. I think I had five. And he said, uh, if you get five more this year, that year, he goes, man, you you could be – they could be looking at you, man. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, St. Louis was great. I worked St. Louis a whole lot. I really loved, loved it. And you're right. St. Louis didn't have a didn't have a crew. They had everybody. When you went to St. Yeah. Louis and you got the program in the dressing room, it was like a who's who of wrestling. Yeah, it's you, like an all-star lineup. Yeah, you, and you never knew, and it was never the same. You know, uh, you go back the next week and it would be an all different card. Next week, did you ever all did you ever make TV in that what the, the Chase Hotel? Oh yeah, I worked the Chase. Yeah. Now, yeah. how did I never went there? But how did that work? Uh, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have never heard of some of this stuff, but the Chase Hotel is where they tape TV, right? Yeah, yeah. And they had tables like a ballroom. Ballroom. It was like a ballroom yeah. setting. They feed you. They, 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 you'd eat. People could eat there. It actually, could, <laughs> you know, you could order. You could order in. I worked at I worked at Chase. Uh, let me tell you about it. One one day, one day in my life, uh, that was a most awesome day. Uh, Flew out of West Palm Beach uh, into into work TV in uh, in in St. Louis and back that night to work the house show in uh, in St. Petersburg uh, in the Coliseum over there. I worked with uh, with uh, with uh, Johnny Valentine on one show. Uh, okay, was he as brutal as they say he was? Oh, I worked with Johnny Valentine in 1973. We were married, man. I must have worked with Johnny Valentine 50 times. I love working with Johnny Valentine yeah. because he was stiff. He was stiff, and I was always a little stiff, too. 
you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and Johnny liked me, Johnny loved me, man. Would I was he light you up? With, would he light you up with that chalk? Oh God, man. He'd like to be, to be old shot, shoot you out on the floor, bring you up, turn you around on the ropes, pull you back uh, till your chest is out there and bring the big hammer down on you, man. Uh, wow. That was, that was the worst shot, the, the big yeah. hammer. You know? So uh, I worked with Johnny Valentine on one TV. The next TV, uh, less than an hour later, I worked with Terry Funk. And an hour mm -hmm. after that, I worked with uh, uh, Gene, the champion. Kaninsky. Gene Kaninsky. Three All guys in, one in day? less than three hours. Three in the guys same place. In, in the same place. And Chase. Three guys in less than three hours. I jumped on the plane and I flew back to Tampa. Got there, the police took me straight to the Coliseum in St. Petersburg, and I worked with uh, Dusty Rhodes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, there, and if you think about that, that's that's the two, three world champions. Actually, Dusty became the champion. Dude. Worked with three world champions and Johnny Valentine in less than six hours. Tremendous story. I mean, See, I don't think like, anybody's ever done that. I, I, I don't think anybody's ever worked with that type well, of course in, in that short you, period of time. Well, I have. I'm, I'm, I'm going to change the story now. I'm going to put <laughs> myself right. in there, and I'm going to have. A, I'm going to call Google, put it. Uh, I'm going to post it somewhere. So, <laughs> and then somebody said I read it somewhere, which means that I wrote it down. Then I read it back to myself, so it had to be true. That is <laughs> a, and I never heard that. I don't think James has ever heard that, but. And you're one of the names that I think doesn't get enough credit for the advancement of this business and the appreciation of it, because you knew it was an art form before you got into it. You, you didn't have to convince the other guys. You just had to convince the fans. And once you had them convinced that there was a tinge of animosity, you know, it's that, I call it the the thin line. Is it real or yeah. is it not? And if you give the people something to think about, you got them. Oh yeah, man. And, and, and I think we did a great job back in the day. Oh, we sure did. Uh, I got to tell them one more man on you. Okay. Uh -oh, 75. Uh -oh. 75. <laughs> uh, we worked this little town, uh, you and John Foley. And uh, I was a heel at, the, at that point. We were all in the same dressing room. And uh, I can't even remember the name of the little town. But uh, I remember it was so hard to find, it wasn't on the map. It was a little town in Tennessee. <laughs> and I remember uh, you asking me when you came in, yeah. you know, you came in late, right? Because nobody could find the school. We were in high school. <laughs> and uh, you came in late and you said, uh, Ron, how did you find this town? Right. And uh, and I, I was I told you an old joke, man. And, and, and I used to tell the guys this the same same story as you. And I said, well, you know, I said, I got a big map on my wall at home. And I said, it's got Knoxville in it and it's got uh, everywhere within 100 miles of Knoxville is on that map. And I said, I, I got a dart. It's like a dart that I keep in my house. And I said, I go over there when I got to look for a new town. I said, I take that dark and I throw it over my shoulder. I can't. I don't look at the map. I throw it without looking. And wherever that dart lands, that's where I book. And uh, so <laughs> then at that same town, it was so far out in the sticks, man, where, you know, nobody could even find it hardly. There was a one lane bridge that came across yeah. to the school itself. They parked out there and then they had to cross this one lane bridge to get to the school. And I remember it had to. Uh, railings along the edge of the window and a high window so you could step up on this little bench and look out yeah, the window. and look out i remember and, looking uh, out and i was back bridge. and forth looking out the window like i usually did she was pacing back and forth and uh and finally uh you're up there and uh you go uh john john come here you gotta see this and uh so uh, i jump up there too to see what you're looking at and there was a little boy probably 12, 14 years old on a donkey came yeah. across the bridge, right? And we were so close to where they were selling tickets, he could hear conversations practically. 
And the kid got off the donkey. You said, look at this, John. Look at that boy. He's riding the donkey. He's coming to the matches on a donkey. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the kid got off the donkey, and he turned the donkey's head around to where he faced the bridge, and he slapped him on the ass, and he said, go home and get mom and pa. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I sure do. I remember a lot of things that that – I mean, those were the days I really, really enjoyed wrestling because I was learning it, and I was learning it. I didn't know you were as – I didn't know you were as knowledgeable as I know you are now. But I still listened and because I've heard some stories about some guys in AEW, the rookies or the younger guys, when the older agents go to them and – Say, why don't you do it? Ah, oh, nah, nah, nah. I just do it my way. Well, if you're not going to listen, <laughs> if you're not going to listen, you're not going to advance. Oh, so, yeah. but anyway, yeah. well, listen, great interview. I appreciate so much you doing the, the podcast with me. We're gonna, I think we'll get a lot of comments on this, and uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. I want you to take care of yourself, and if you ever need me, just give me a call. Thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate it, man. Uh, thanks for being on. Uh, always love you, man. You're one of my favorite dudes in the business. Thank you. Can I uh, jump in very briefly? I know Ron has got a podcast. I know he's got a YouTube channel. Would you yeah, like to does, hit yes. us with all the plugs? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I, have a, um, I have a podcast I've been doing uh, for almost six years. I'm 304 episodes in. I do it every week. And... Uh, it's called uh, Ron Fuller Studcast. Uh, I have a YouTube page, Southeastern Rewind. I put that uh, Studcast on there. Uh, I have a website, pretty big website, tnstud.com. It's got all of my Studcast on it, all of my super Studcast, one of which is, is with Dutch, a uh, great one. Uh, number 19, as a matter of fact. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I even have a, uh, now I have a, 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 a streaming channel. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. So uh, I got a lot going on, man. A lot of, a lot so of things. With your, wait a minute. With your continental footage, you didn't sell that? No. No. What I you, still uh, have it. Were you approached about selling it? Uh, no. No. And in fact, uh, I approached uh, New York about buying it. And uh, and they they didn't uh, they didn't have any interest. Mm-hmm. You know, Crazy. So, uh, so, yeah, you know, so I'm sitting on, I have not just that, I have some Southeastern. I have stuff going all the way back to Hulk's first match on television. Hulk wow. Hogan. He started for me in, uh, in down in that territory. In, uh, and how can the fans find this? Uh, they can find these on uh, uh, on my, uh, my uh, streaming channel, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Uh, it's got okay. Southeastern wrestling on it. It's got uh, continental wrestling shows on it. It's got all of the USA wrestling shows on it. Uh, it doesn't have all of continental on it yet, and it doesn't have all of the uh, uh, the Southeastern on it yet because I had, just hadn't, hadn't been in there long enough, hadn't been on long enough to get them all up. But uh, I found a whole lot of shows of, from all those years, which are classic stuff, man. Uh, Greatest this, work of some of the greatest of all. Yeah, were these from the original tapes? Are they original, people taped? Original tapes, yeah. The, no, wow. not original tapes. God okay. knows I wish I had the original tapes, man. You know, the but tapes I was are like this big, right? Oh, the big two inch jobs, you know, the way oh, yeah, 75 huge. pounds. And, uh, you know, uh, if uh, if I'd known today what, what uh, everybody else, uh, you know, not many people back in the day, though, ever saved those tapes. You know that? Nope. No, nope. uh, because companies just rolled them. It came in and just okay, record on this one, record right over. They recorded right over top of some fantastic stuff. Obviously. No kidding. But uh, it, so, it was good for. I heard it was good for five or six retapings because yeah. they were expensive, weren't they? Oh yeah, yeah. Those suckers were about two hundred bucks a piece. back in the day. Yeah, a piece. Could you that know? be like almost a thousand today? Oh yeah, jeez, man! It it was a lot of money for those damn things. Okay, man. another another thing I have a lot of respect for you for Ron is you're a published author. Yeah, tell man. us about the tell tell us about the book that is not about wrestling. 
Uh, yeah, I wrote a book, man. I had a dream one night, crazy. Uh, I've already <laughs> retired. Uh, yeah, I was living. I was retired. I was retired. I was out of everything. I'd lived in the Keys for three years. Came back to Tennessee, bought myself a big house, and uh, and uh, and I had a dream one night about this lion that got loose in the Smoky Mountains National Park. And uh, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I woke up my wife. I said, uh, "Wow, man, I just had this crazy dream, man. You know." <laughs> Uh, and, and, and it's kind of left me hanging here. And so I went back to sleep and I had the rest of the dream. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I got the second part of the dream and I woke up then the next morning and I said, I got to write a book. And she goes about wrestling. And I go, no, I got to write a book about this dream I had last night. She goes, are you probably you serious? And I spent two years in the basement of my house writing this book about mm -hmm. the lion uh, called Brutus name of yeah. it's Brutus. And, uh, and it's basically about a lion that gets a, a man-eating lion gets captured in Africa. He gets sent to a zoo in Knoxville. They yeah. don't know he's got a man-eater. Uh, he don't eat anything but men, humans, which is true. Lions, once they taste human flesh, don't want to eat anything else because uh, they, they it's, it's obviously the, the ultimate meal. Snobby bastards. Yeah, bastards. Yeah, no shit. And uh, so you know, uh, so yeah, so the you know this this guy, it, it's a crazy story. You know, it's it's kind of like a deliverance, dude. Like the deliverance. You've seen that old deliverance movie, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it, its main character uh, fall. He is in the caretaker. We in the damn zoo, and he falls in love with the lion. The lion won't eat. He brings him deer. He brings him all the food, everything he can think of, and then uh, finally. Uh, he uh he figures out that uh that, that the lion's a man eater. He finds out that the lion's a man eater. And uh so uh he ends up going and and, pill and pillaging the 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 old city in Knoxville, the old drunken saloon parts of town, picking up drunks and uh, killing them and sending them and taking them back and feeding them to the lion. Wow, that makes the story a lot better. Feeds it, feeds the drunks, feeds it. Now they got a serial killer loose in town. They don't know what to, what these all about and what where these bodies are going. And, and uh, they can't and the they lion, can't find they can't find the bodies. Yeah, they can't. There is nobody. The no. lion is a he's a main maniacal son of a bitch, right? And once he gets <laughs> that food, he drops that food down there in the cave to him. Uh, you know, he just go. He eats everything except the skulls. Whatever's left, he picks up the pieces. He takes them home to his house and stashes them in an old cave behind his room. Anyway, uh, the, the lion's going to get moved. He's going to lose his lion. Lion's going to get moved from Knoxville. He gets bought by the Charlotte Zoo. And when they get ready to ship him across the Smoky Mountains, instead of shipping him down the I-40, they have a big uh, landslide on I-40. And, uh, when they ship him, they got to take him through the middle of the Smoky Mountains National Park. The only way mm -hmm. to get him through there. And uh, so the old boy that uh, takes care of feeding him, he hides along the route. And when the truck comes with his line, he forces the truck off the road. And the truck wrecks and his line gets loose in the park. Then the story starts. You imagine wow. the line loose in the Smoky how, Mountains National how'd Park. The, how'd the book do? Oh, the book is good, man. I mean, it's I sell. I mean, how did how did it sell? It was good. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm still selling. I'm still selling it, man. It's good. It's a I'll, it's a hell of a book. Uh, I got some. I got the re, You know, I've got these reviews that are just amazing, man. California people. I've talked to all kinds of people. They're big wheels. You know, they go, "Wow, book! Your book is fabulous, Ron. Son of a bitch! I can't believe you can write like this." You know, so. It's, I spent two years screwing with it, man, and it was kind of like a project. And uh, and then I, here's the crazy part. I stuck it in a drawer for 20 years. I didn't get it published. I put it in a drawer for 20 so years. you had the dream 20 years before you wrote it? Uh, no, I had the dream, and I wrote the book immediately. But when I finished the book, it was 2001, and, oh, I, bought, I, I, and I went to work. Uh, I, I bought myself a franchise, an ADT. So I just set the book into a drawer for 20 years. And then I kept, 20 years later, I went in the drawer one day and I said, why not? I need to fucking do something with this. Yeah. And then I figured I got it published, you know? So, uh, and that's when you went down to the basement. 
Yeah, I went down to the basement now. Fin finished it. Yeah, well, it was pretty well finished. I, I pretty well finished the book, but I just didn't go through the process of, of getting it printed and getting it published. You had to have, the, in the old days, to be a writer, you got to have an agent, basically. Yeah, you did. You got to get it. It's what it used to be. Now, now you don't. Somewhere. But uh, you had to get you an agent. You had to get a publishing company that would talk to your agent. You had to go through all the bullshit. And it, and I just got tired of the bullshit part of it. I threw the book in the in the drawer and uh, left it there for twenty years. Then came back and uh, finished her uh, finished her up hey, and got published. James, any more questions? Would you beg my indulgence, Ron? I've got one or two. Or do you have to run? No, 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 man. I'm fine. Okay. I know that Dutch wanted to ask you about wrestling the bear, but I'll leave that to him. Uh, I wanted to ask you because you mentioned just beforehand uh, uh, your YouTube channel and all the footage. And one of the top videos on the YouTube channel is Hulk Hogan arm wrestling Andre the Giant. And My company. You've got to you've got to tell us the whole story, booking it. And I suppose uh, people love to hear like stories of a younger Andre and a really young Hulk at the same time. Right. Yeah, that was my company, Southeastern, uh, down there in the Gulf Coast, and uh, and uh, uh, Hulk was super green. Man, uh, he couldn't he couldn't work worth a shit. In fact, I went down to Louis <laughs> Tillet. You know Louis? Louis oh, Tillet. I, I know him. Louis Tillet uh, called me up, and I had him booking down there. And he says, Ron, I found this guy in Tampa. He goes, he's a big son of a bitch, man. He says, but he, he can't work. He's not too good in the ring, you know. Uh, and he says, uh, can you come down and work with him? So I came down, uh, you know, I worked about, uh, I probably worked for two months night after night, lots of, uh, probably three times a week with Hogan, trying to teach him, trying to, trying to let him to get a feel for, for the business. And uh, so uh, then uh, Louis comes to me and he says, Ron, I, I got a great angle. I got a great angle. Like, well, let's get Andre in here. And uh, so uh, Andre came down. Andre had never met him. This is the first time these two guys ever saw themselves. Right. The, you know, and uh, so, uh, and I was at the deal. Louis, Louis brought me to his house. He brought uh, Andre into his house. He brought Andre a day early, as a matter of fact. And then he brought Hulk in. And uh, we sat there and, uh, and they introduced those two guys. And they talked. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, Andre loved him right off the bat. God, he's, he's, he's the only guy I can ever work with. He knew that right away. You know, he was like, God, Louis, you're right. You know, you told me right, Louis, uh, he, he's the guy. He's for me, man. And, you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, we worked a little angle on TV uh, and you probably saw that you've seen it, I guess, obviously, Jay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, James, uh, so it, uh, it's a pretty good little angle. I mean, it worked. It worked pretty good. But you could see how Green Hulk was in the in the angle. You know, he had Andre going a little bit. Andre got juice for him the whole deal. Yeah, you know, I'd never seen Andre get blood for anybody. I was like, some bitch, Andre. You could go that far? Hell yeah, yeah. I'm on. I like the guy. I want to see what he can do. You know. And uh, so he got the juice, and uh, and then Hulk pounded on him a little bit, and then he ran and got out of the ring. And, uh, and Billy Spears was his manager. And Spears says, get in there. Where did you get your fuck? Go get him. God. Andre still kind of bent over in the corner and waiting on him, right, to get to come get more heat. And, uh, you know, so uh, it, was, it was a hell of a little angle, man. And uh, that's where those guys got together. And uh, so that's how it's on, Hulk got that's there. On, it's on tape? Huh? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, it's on my it's on my on my channel on my streaming. I channel. gotta I I gotta check you know? it out. Yeah, but uh, see yeah. that's one of the that's one of the gems that people don't know. And where is this again? Yeah, this was in it, it was in Dothan's TV, Dothan, Alabama. On Dothan's yeah, but where, TV. Can, where can we find it online? Uh, Classic Continental Wrestling. Classic Continental Wrestling dot com. Yeah, got it. And uh, Got and then uh, and then I have his first uh, Hulk's first television match uh, with a green kid, you know, and Hulk's green as shit too. You can tell once you watch the match, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the only footage. No, no, no telling what the, that footage. The rest of that footage, he come. I have I brought in guys. We brought in guys to work with him, man, from all over. Big name dudes, man. Uh, some of them not so good. Uh, I got to tell you, one of these matches, Dutch, and you can imagine just from listening to the two of these guys. Uh, can you imagine watching a match with him and Ox Baker? 
Good God. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slapping his hands. <laughs> ah. I mean, uh, there's some, there would have to be some classic matches, man. That we, Did, do you we, have that match? Huh? I don't have, have that the... match. No. Ugh. I only have two Hulk matches of all the time that he, he worked for me probably the first uh, six months of his career. Mm. And, uh, and uh, then he went and went to went to New York pretty quickly after that. He went from me into Memphis for a little short run in Memphis, and then he went to Georgia and uh, Minneapolis, and then, wasn't it? Huh? Then he go to Minneapolis for, for New York. Yeah, I no. think he goes there after he goes up. He gets his shot into New York because uh, he worked for me. Uh, this was from uh, May of 1979 up to about the middle of. Uh, July of 1979, then he went to Memphis, then he went into Georgia, and I sold my territory to uh, Jim Barnett out of Atlanta. Yeah. And so then Barnett asked me on Thanksgiving of 1979 if I would work with the Hulk in Knoxville. And uh, so he put me over, and and they and they and uh, the finish was that they told him uh, that they wanted uh, him to go over. And Hulk says, Ron, you, you've been so good to me, man. You, you've taught me so much. He goes, I don't want to beat you in this town. He goes, this is your town. You built this town. It was, you know, I know your history here. He said, uh, I, I want you to beat me. You know, so we figured to finish where I beat him. Uh, so kind of a God deal. And then he went from there. He says, Ron, next week I'm going to New York. I'm going to work for, for McMahon Sr. Mm -hmm. And then he worked there a short period of time. Like senior didn't like him. Senior didn't like him. He went to Minneapolis. And then uh, so he went. So he went to New York. I mean, he went to New York a short period of time before he went to Minneapolis. Then he yeah. got over in Minneapolis. He got over in Minneapolis. He got his shit together. And then uh, Vince Junior was the guy that was hot for him. Vince mm -hmm. Jr. liked him. Senior didn't like him. Junior liked him. Junior heard what went on over there in uh, Vern's territory, and he said, oh, i got to get this guy back. Um, a lot of history uh, there, man. Uh, it is a lot of history there. I'm going to ask you one more thing, and we're going to close this down. You remember your dad wanted, it's not a bear, it's a gorilla. <laughs> he wanted to, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. I think your dad comes and said, oh, we, we wore the bear out. We need something different. This guy has this gorilla, and we could train that gorilla. Okay, we could we could do something. So y'all went to see this gorilla wherever he was, and you checked him out. What happened? Yeah. What? And you he walked off, and you was watching this gorilla. Well, it was actually you know Lester Welch. You know Lester. Oh, yeah, you know, I, yeah, Lester? oh yeah, I know him. Okay, Lester and Dad. Lester and Dad had trained their own wrestling bear years and years ago in the fifties. Early fifties, okay, and uh, so uh, and, and I got a real quick story. I got to tell you this because it's so good. Uh, so they they had their own bear and they they put him in the back seat of the car and they take him out <laughs> down to the gym training, right? Yeah, they stick him in the back seat of the car and they rolled the window down so that he could breathe. You know, and this is back in the fifties. There wasn't no air conditioning, right? So bear has head stuck out the window. And dad told me, he said, one Sunday morning, he said, me and Lester got up real early and we got the bear. We put him in the back seat. And he said, we drove downtown Dyersburg, Tennessee. You may yep. have even worked there, right? There's a little no hole in the wall town. And he said, uh, they pulled up to the red light. And he said, there's a guy, the drunk. And he said, there's a drunk. He's got the bottle of beer. <laughs> he got his bottle in his hand. And he says, he's kind of weaving on the, you know, like, oh, uh, you know. And uh, so he said, we pulled up and the bear's got his head out. And he says, his, his head's only probably three feet away from the drunk. And the drunk's like, God, he's looking him over, right? And uh, <laughs> dad, said, dad says, uh, what do you think of my dog? Right? And the, and the, <laughs> drunk, <laughs> the drunk goes, God damn, I thought that was a bar. <laughs> oh my god. And I bet he would he would go tell that story and people said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Nobody nobody's believing that. Uh, no shit. You didn't see a bear in the back seat of a car, you drunk. So yeah. so you remember so, the gorilla story? So Lester take Lester and Dad go to go check out the gorilla. 
they talk about it and say, you know, let's do something never been done. You know, let's find a gorilla. Maybe we can train a gorilla. They talked to talking about it. We had to cut his ligaments and we, we, lo- we, we weaken him up to where he can't hurt anybody. So they got to the gorilla place and dad is standing there talking to uh, the gorilla guy. You know, about, you know, it's a different, what do you want for him, that type of deal. And uh, while he's doing that, Lester's standing looking through the cage at him, looking through the cage at the gorilla. And they have a big old truck tire in it, right? Just the rubber part of it. And uh, the, <laughs> Lester's watching. He said the gorilla picks up the tire and he goes, boom, boom. He slaps it, pushes it down, boom, boom like this, right? He, Pushes it all the way, lops at it, and it pops back out. Boom, boom. He did. And he says he's looking at me while he's doing it. Lester tells the story. He says, this, this girl is looking at me like this is huge. So boom, boom. <laughs> with the tire. And uh, so he, Lester goes, Dad's still in the conversation with the guy trying to get the price for the girl. And uh, Lester's tagging him on. Her. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, hey, come here. Come, come here. He drags him over to the deal. He said, watch. And the gorilla is boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that was the end of the gorilla train. <laughs> I guess. A gorilla could kill you. <laughs> so anyway, James, you got any more questions? Dutch, I've got a million of them. An absolute million questions. I'll just go through some of the ones that I won't ask. So, you know, I was going to ask questions about Harley Race. I was going to ask questions about Bullet Bob Armstrong, the NWA, the conventions, the carnival days of wrestling. Oh, Ron, was it your grandfather who invented the human shit headlock? Well, uh, that was Herb. Herb, Herb, that was my granddad's brother, Herb. Herb trained, Herb trained Honky Tonk Man, David Schultz, and Coco Beware. You know that? What are they? There's three, three Hall of Famers, right? Mm-hmm. Herb trained all those guys. And uh, yeah, Herb was a freak. Herb was a shit freak. You know? Uh, no, we can't, uh, we're, I don't know if you're recording, man, if you're recording, but Herb was a, he was kind of strange. Let's call it that, right? And uh, and he had a guy named an old wrestler that uh, named Moody Palmer. He was a farmer during the day, and he worked some for Roy and uh, and with Herb. And and uh, Moody wouldn't take a bath after he worked all day. He'd come to the matches ready to wrestle, and when you went in the ring and worked with him, oh, he he must have smelled horrible, right? So uh, Herb had done put up with it for a long time, and uh, and uh. Finally, one night they went in and uh, <laughs> started, it was a three. It was a three foul match, right? Yeah, I think it was a three foul match. Yes, and, uh, and then finally on the end of the deal, Herb went back in the dressing room and he shit in his hand, which he was very good at. It, obviously, back in the day, from the stories that I've heard, right? He was very good with it. Oh my god! And, and he wiped it underneath his arm, and then he uh. went and got him in a headlock, <laughs> and. Uh, uh. And then he took him over in the headlock. And he did, boy, he just scrunched it and he moved his body around so he got this <laughs> shit all over his face. And uh, <laughs> you gotta imagine the guy was screaming. And I think one of my gr- grandfather's relatives, one of my relatives, was the referee. And uh, so, so Herb held him until the guy was about to puke. Herb didn't want him to puke under his arm. <laughs> so he let him up. And when he let him up, uh, Moody Palmer jumped up and he had shit all over his face. And he, uh, and he screams really loud. And the crowd's quiet. They can't figure out. He's got a headlock. I mean, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? This guy's acting like he's killing him. And he's just got a headlock on him, right? And uh, so when he lets him up, the crowd's still real quiet. And he, he looks at the referee, Moody Palmer does, and he goes, Referee, this man has shit. <laughs> oh, oh, that had now, to be a classic. Moment. We we need that on tape. <laughs> that would be great to have on tape. Oh, you need an X rated. You need an X rated. No dude. kidding. Rated show, man. Uh, that's that, one of the that, stories. That's one of the forgotten stories. Oh, I, 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 I think think one that, you never heard this one about Herb. I'm sure that Herb Breeze, Herb was really a great guy. A hell of a worker, one of the greatest workers of all time, which was really, really good. Uh, 
that he used to stay at the Maxwell House Hotel in Nashville, which was mm -hmm. a big time hotel. And uh, and they wouldn't charge him. They loved him. He was a big star, right? So they said, "Hey, Herb, you stay for free. You don't have to pay us, whatever." You know. So Herb, Herb got to where he would uh, is a part of a rib. It was a shit shitting and doing something with it. Was, was a rib for him. He'd shit the guy's <laughs> bag while they were in the ring. I mean, just crazy stuff. So uh, so he's in the hotel, Maxwell House, fine hotel, man, beautiful hotel. And uh, so he would hide shit in the room every time he left. They couldn't rent the room for a couple of days, right? And uh, and then they'd finally find it, right? And uh, you know, and they didn't even call him, right? They 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 respected him so much. I guess they didn't want to talk to him about it. Right? What are you doing this for, right? Anyway, so they they kept finding this shit and finding the shit and finding the shit. One of the days, <laughs> finally, and he hides it in a different place every time. It's like a game, you know. And uh, so finally, he hides it where they can't find it, and they call him up. They have to call him up first time. Guy from the desk says, uh, "Mr. Welch, uh, gosh, man, you know, I hate to call you, Mr. Welch, and that, you know, but we we got a little problem this time. You know, uh, we don't normally have, you know, we are normally able to find the, you know, they were hesitant to even say shit, right? We 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 <laughs> normally are able to find it, but but we couldn't find it this time, and uh, and we can't put anybody on that floor because it's it stinks coming from the room now down the fucking old hallway and then in the other rooms on that floor because. Uh, would you be so kind as to tell us where you did, where it is? Where, where'd you put it this time? Where'd you have the shit? <laughs> so Herb says, uh, he goes, oh, he goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, uh, you know that big old four-poster bed, you know, you got in that room? He said, yeah. He goes, uh, you need to pull the knobs off the top of that poster bed. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I think you'll find what you're looking for. <laughs> oh my God. Now, folks, that is a story you will hear nowhere else except oh, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> stories from Dutch. <laughs> Be a Ron Fuller. Oh, All right, Ron, we'll, we'll we'll let you go. Appreciate it very much. I've already said that once. James, any more? Plenty, part two. You you do the closeout, Dutch. All right, so uh, in, enjoyed you being here today, Ron. I know all the fans will yeah, be... Yeah, I'd be glad uh, to come back, man. I love it. I love it, man. I love dealing with you, man. I love giving you the stories and shit. Uh, we did, There's a lot of things. You mentioned now, this a whole is, lot of things there, James. I mean, those three guys you mentioned, man, there's, there's a lot of damn talk and just stories of Armstrong and Harley and uh, Valentine. We could get into some Johnny Bell. I never, there's a great one about Rob. One of the about greatest who? stories of Rob, my brother, right? Yeah. Rob rode down the road with me during this time frame when I worked with Johnny every night. And he would, every night going home from the town, he would go, God, Ron, that son of a bitch. How do you deal with it? He, how does he, he said, he's going to hurt you, man. He goes, well, he just, it's unbelievable. Jesus, he goes, I, I would never, I hope to God they don't book me while I'm here in this territory, right? So oh, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't touch Rob. He'd go, oh, Lord. Oh, yeah, God. Rob. You know, so you know how Rob was, right? So, uh, so this is great. You love this. So, uh, we go to TV one day and, uh, you know, and I told Louie, Louie was the booker. And I said, Louie, uh, do me a favor. Said, uh, book me and Rob against uh, Valentine, somebody. <laughs> And so he says, why, Ron? I go, oh, it's just a personal deal. You know, it's cool. They do it for me, right? So, so he, he does. So, so we go into TV one day. And, oh, you know how Rob is. He's all happy-go-lucky. Hey, everybody, grab ass and then no bullshit. And, you know, and then he goes to Louie. And he says, oh, what's uh, who are we working with uh, today, Louie? And he goes, uh, Buddy Colt and Johnny Valentine. And Rob's <laughs> – and I watch, and Rob, I'm over – here I can like I don't know about what's going on. I see him drops his head like, oh shit. And then and he comes back over and he and and I and I kind of I say, well, who are we working with? Oh god. <laughs> so, god. Uh. Oh shit. You know, I mean uh, so uh, then we go out. So I buzz Valentine, I buzz Johnny, man, I found him, man. 
hey, shoot him mm-hmm. out on the floor, give him the old deal, man. And uh, so he goes up. Uh, All right, okay, okay. okay. So, so here we get the so we get the match going, and uh, and uh, Rob gets in there with Valentine, and uh, Johnny shoots him out. Johnny had to do. He used to do this old deal. He grabs the front of your tights and he 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 give you the thumb and the belly to let you know it's coming. I'm going to hit you fucking as hard as I can in your gut, right? And then, boy, he'd bust you. So, and then he would shoot you straight out onto the floor. And then uh, when you got out on the floor, he had the same MO. He was, uh, he'd get a hold of you. He'd drag you up on the apron. He would uh, turn you around backwards, put your, ro- hand, your arms back over the rope, take your chin, shove it back out of the way, and bring the hammer, right? And uh, so... That's he gives Rob the routine. He shouts him out onto the floor, and uh, and and Colt's over there. He knows the fucking deal. What's going on? Too. And then he grabs him and he grabs him up on the apron. He he opens him up, spreads him out all big big time, and uh, uh-huh. and he raises the big hammer. And when he drops it, and he, he throws he, his hands over his chest. Yeah, he he goes up slow, doesn't he? Oh yeah. And, and then it's he brings it. Up. It's a big buildup because he's coming. He's gonna. He's gonna knock your fucking belongs out. <laughs> <laughs> and he is right. So Rob, instead of leaving himself open, he covers his chin. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll I'm looking over there at Colt, and we both crack up, man. I got to hide my face in the turnbuckle, son of a bitch. And uh, so Valentine, Valentine goes, Ah, you ah, God, man. He, he grabs one arm again. He grabs the other arm. He throws him. He, he stretches him out again. He raises the hammer, and here he comes. Rob does it again. <laughs> Oh, man. Did, <laughs> buddy with this, but oh, Rob ended that, that after that match. He goes, God, no, did he ever give him the shot? Huh? Oh, yeah, shit, yeah. We third time in was charm. I think he and he buzzed him too. I never asked Rob what he told him, but you know, Valentine got that arm and he reached down there. And so, what did him. Rob say back in the dressing room? Oh, he was like, he goes, Ron, he goes. I thought it was going to be bad. He goes, but it was fucking worse than anything I ever thought I'd do. Oh, man. It was about in tears. I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> I wish I, I, I could see that on tape. That is a, that is a classic. <laughs> anyway, hey, Ron, let me get you out of here. I mean, I could just bring you on and just, just bring up names and you just tell me stories. I don't even have oh, to know man, anything about it. Yeah, just I anything. A few, of them, man. I, I, a few of them. You got a lot of them. And I got some of my stories from you. Because I, I got was, some of mine from you. Well, good. <laughs> I, but I want to I want to read your book. It's called what is it? Brutus. Uh, Brutus. Oh, I'm gonna tell you what. You send me, you use uh send me your uh text me your address. Okay. I'll send you a book. I'll send you one. All right. Okay. Yeah, you read it. I, I like to hear what you think. All right, I will. Okay. I wish I hadn't well, told you the whole story, but that ain't the whole story. It's got to help. Well, you told me. Ending. It's got to help. Me, ending. Yeah, you told me just enough to get me to read the book. See, I never knew about the murderer in there. I thought the the lion was doing all this, or oh, but it's a guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a guy I'm was killing him. It's intricate. It's 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 a lot going on in that book. Man, you got this from a dream. I dreamed it. The whole damn thing, man, crazy. <laughs> two, two, two dreams. Woke up, went back, picked yeah. up on the dream. Same yeah, place you got, that I went to be sleep, woke up on. That's part two. Unbelievable. Part two. Yeah. So, All right, I'm going to wrap it up, folks. And uh, Ron, where can, they, where can they find you? You can find me, man, at uh, tnstud.com on the web. Uh, Ron Fuller, Studcast. Uh, right. Got 304 of them suckers out there now, man, uh, in the year 1979. Uh, okay. Yeah. YouTube uh, at Southeastern Rewind, uh, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com, streaming channel. Good. And you can uh, – I'm not going to tell the story about my website because it's always the same. I will figure out how to get it. It's online, but it's it's all to hell. 
I had this guy help me and I, he was a, uh, he must've been a drug addict or something and yeah. I don't fool with it. But if you want to get a hold of me folks, dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com and I'll get back to you. So until next week, fans, Ron, thank you a lot. James, thank you a lot. And uh, we'll see you next week.